Good evening, and thank you for viewing the August 17th meeting of the Arcata City Council. The City Council meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with both in-person attendance and teleconference access via Zoom. Our first item is a land acknowledgement. The City of Arcata acknowledges that the lands we are located on are the unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat tribe. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. <clears throat> Past actions by local, state, and federal governments removed the Wiats and other indigenous peoples from the land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy narratives of settler colonialism. If you would like to, please join us for the flag salute. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Mayor Atkins Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor Schaefer? Here. Council Member Matthews? Here. Council Member Watson? Here. Council Member Stillman? Yes, I'm here. All present. Thank you. If you wish to make a comment during the meeting, either at the two open public comment periods or for an individual agenda item, there are three ways to do so. If you are here in person, please line up behind the podium when the item you would like to speak on is accepting public comment. If you are logged on to Zoom, click raise your hand when it is time for public comment on the item you wish to speak on. If you are on the phone, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your turn, you will be prompted to dial star six on your phone. For each item, we will be taking in-person public comment first and then move to the online comments. We will not be going back and forth, so if you are wanting to comment um, and you are here in person, please be sure that you line up at the podium um, or online, raise your electronic hand as soon as public comment is requested for that item. And since we're doing um, something not new, but new to recent times. And we're going back to the numbered system just to be sure that we have enough time for everyone. So for the, um, the early oral communications, that's the only one that has the time limit on it. So it's a 15 minute time period. And we don't traditionally go over that, but um, just you know, t for best practices, if you're here in person, grab a card if you're wanting to speak in that early oral communications and we'll take the first four cards first here and then we'll go online and take the next four cards for people online and then if there's more time we'll we'll go we'll go back and forth so yeah um be sure that you do that okay so that takes us to ceremonial matters um, first we have a recognition of steve martin for 22 years of service on the parks and recreation committee and council member matthews is going to read that recognition the certificate of recognition is presented to Steve Martin, the City Council of the City of Arcata, hereby recognizes and thanks Stephen Martin for his 22 years of service on the Arcata Parks and Recreation Committee. Stephen served as the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee for over 10 years. As the chair and as a committee member, he brought insight and caring to guide the city's expansion of recreational programming and upgrades to many of Arcata's parks. Most recently, these included Shea, Valley West, Greenview, Ennis, and the Arcata Ball Park, as well as the development of the Futsal Court at the Arcata Sports Complex. The Council expresses its sincere appreciation for its guidance, support, and work to benefit our entire community. Signed, Stacey Alex is our mayor. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you for your service. Okay, next we have a proclamation recognizing September 4th through 10th, 2022 as Suicide Prevention Week. And Council Member Watson will read that proclamation. And then I believe we have Heather Freitas that is here in person and he will present that to her after he's done reading it. Recognizing September 4th through 10th, 2022 as Suicide Prevention Week, whereas suicide is a national and statewide public health problem and suicide prevention is a national and statewide responsibility. 
And whereas suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the United States, the third leading cause of death among children and teens aged 10 to 19, and the second leading cause of death among individuals between ages of 20 to 34. And whereas it is estimated that in 2020, there were 1.2 suicide attempts, over 45,000 people died by suicide in the US, with 4,411 of those deaths occurring in California. And whereas over 90% of the people who die by suicide have a diagnosable and treatable mental health condition, although often that condition was not recognized or treated. And whereas organizations such as the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention are dedicated to saving lives and bringing hope to those affected by suicide through research, education, advocacy, and resources for those who have lost someone to suicide or who struggle in, <clears throat> and urge that we recognize suicide as a preventable national and state public health problem and declare suicide prevention to be a priority. Acknowledge that no single suicide prevention program or effort will be appropriate for all populations or communities. Address the disparity in access to mental health care for undeserved and underrepresented groups and advocates for ending these disparities. Fund new suicide research to support culturally informed and evidence-based mental health care and services. Encourage initiatives in ARCADA based on the goals contained in the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention and the 2022 California Suicide Prevention Plan. Promote awareness that there is no single cause for suicide and that suicide Suicide most often occurs when stressors exceed the coping abilities of someone struggling with a mental health condition. Develop and implement strategies to improve and increase access to quality mental health, substance abuse, and suicide prevention services and programs. And lastly, continue advocacy to ensure we can reimagine a comprehensive suicide, mental health, and substance use crisis response system that builds on the historic new 988 number, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, 988 number for the suicide and crisis lifeline. Um, Therefore, be it proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Arcata, hereby recognizes September 4th through 10th, 2022 as Suicide Prevention Week and recognizes September 10th as World Suicide Prevention Day. Signed today, or yeah, signed in the future, September 7th, by Mayor Stacey atkins -Alzer. And accepting... And if, if you had something you wanted to say, Heather, you're more than welcome to do that. You also don't have to, but you can. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. Um, well, my name is Heather Freitas. I am the board secretary for the Greater San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and our local walk chair for the Arcata Out of the Darkness Community Walk. Um, first, I want to thank you on behalf of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for recognizing um, suicide Prevention Week, September 4th through the 10th in 2022 as Suicide Prevention Week for our community. I think, um, well, I would hope that we all recognize that these are really critical issues that impact our community, particularly Northern California, and that they are, um, I guess, priorities for us. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to share with everyone here our upcoming Arcade Out of the Darkness Community Walk. So this happens actually at the close of Suicide Prevention Week on September 11th, it's a Sunday. It begins and ends on the Arcade Plaza. We will be there from about nine to noon. Um, we have an opening and closing ceremony. It's a walk that's approximately three miles. We'll have um, speakers and community resources that can connect people with mental health services uh, and, and programs like that, as well as other materials that can be really helpful for either people coming or people that others might know. Um, I also brought some flyers actually for the City of Ar uh, Arcata Council, so if I can hand those out. Thank you. So that's all I have, but if anybody wants a flyer, I have some. Thank you. Thank you. So next on the agenda um, is our a report by Commissioner Committee, and we have an annual report from the Energy Committee, and I believe online we have Carice Geronimo and Jim Zolik. 
Hi. Hello. Um, good evening, City Council and City staff. My name is Karee Saranimo, and I'm a member of the Energy Committee. Um, and as you said, I'm joined by Jim Zolik, a longtime member of the committee as well. Um, we have the pleasure of working with Emily Benby as our staff liaison, and we've been up to quite a lot. Um, but I'm told that the agenda uh, is pretty packed this evening, so I'll try to keep it fixing. Um, so last year, the committee continued to work on the all electric initiative, which includes decarbonization and electrification of city and privately owned buildings. We also investigated options to increase equity and affordability of electrification. Um, the committee received reports from staff about electric vehicle charging stations within the city, and we looked into uh, battery storage grant opportunities for the wastewater treatment plant, pump stations, and other city buildings. Um, and we also had a reach code subcommittee that did some research on natural gas ban ordinances requiring all electric new construction for reducing greenhouse gases. The committee continues to work closely and collaboratively with the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, 350 Humboldt, Rocker, and Redwood Energy, um, and thank them for their work on energy and climate related issues. Last year, we received an update on the Gateway Area Plan and prioritized energy related implementation measures to be included in the draft plan. And similarly, we provided feedback on considerations for use of climate related ARPA funds. So um, moving into goals for the coming year, um, several of them are repeat goals um, from last year, since a lot of these efforts are large and ongoing. Um, but notably, we made a commitment to furthering energy related environmental justice and social equity across these goals. Um, so we're planning to continue to work with the county to adopt and implement a regional climate action plan. Um, continue working with staff on the transportation mode shift um, with a focus on walking, biking, public transportation, and electric modes of transport. Um, also continuing work on decarbonizing and electrifying city and privately owned buildings and looking into projects that generate energy from diversion of organic waste um, that can provide greenhouse gas emissions reductions and also meet air quality emission standards. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to share what we've been up to. Um, we can take questions and Jim, uh, please chime in if I've forgotten anything. Hey, do we have any questions? No questions, but thank you for your work. Um, I was going to ask and, and just thank you both for being here um, and thank you, Carice, for presenting. Um, do you guys have any idea? I know that you have been working hard and on and for a while on the all electric initiative um, when when we might be seeing that as a, as a council. Um, I know that some folks in our CEA ha had mentioned Eureka was trying to do a similar thing as well. So just uh, kind of an update on the status if you guys had that. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I would I would say um, probably best to check with Emily. I know that we've been working with with staff on that, and um, it, it's great that the city has um, uh, environmental services staff that that you know have time to actually focus on these energy issues because we're a volunteer committee and, and we're only meeting every other month at this time. So, um, uh, but I know that staff has been doing a bunch of work there, um, and then when we meet, we we've been talking about it. So. I would expect it should, um, well, yeah, I would expect it's going to probably still be a few months out, but um, hopefully there's something maybe early next year. But I would check with Emily for, for uh, probably a better clarity on that. Sure. Thank you, Jim and Chris. I can chime in. I do expect we'll have a draft before council. I would say first reading by late fall. So, yeah, you'll see it soon. Thank you. That's my only question. Thanks, Emily. I didn't realize you were you were here. <laughs> she is. Thank you. Any other questions from council? No questions. Thanks again for um, the committee's work. Okay. Thank there you. There's one public question online. Okay. Let's go ahead. Um, if there's anyone that is. Um, a member of the public that's wanting to make uh, a comment, you could come line up um, right by the podium. Sorry, I didn't announce that earlier because we, we normally don't have them, but it's 
great that we do. So we'll take the in-person comments first. Good evening, Gregory Day. I wasn't really going to respond to this, but I just I heard them talking about is it strictly new construction or is it existing construction? Because I, I seem to re read a report on the city's website that they were a possibility of um, eliminating gas. So I just wanted to know whether that was true or we're we just talking about strictly new construction going all electric. Oh, sorry. Thank you for that question. Do we have anyone else in person who would like to, to comment? Okay, how about, uh, I know we have someone online. Go ahead, Hi. Jane. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for your report and your work because it's very important. I'd be very interested in knowing whether your comments are going to be reflected in the plans that we have for the gateway plan, um, area plan. Um, and exactly what the status of that is, because it really hasn't been discussed except in generality. So um, I think it'd be great if we could learn more about that. And then secondly, I want to make a note that I set up a brown bag lunch program through OLLI on December 5th, where uh, Emily Benvy is going to be uh, talking about Arcata's plan. It will be preceded by Michael Richardson who uh, is the county um, climate action plan head. So uh, we will hear more about where it's at at that time as well. And that is open to the public. And you can go to the OLLI, humboldt.edu slash OLLI to uh, attend that. It's free. So thank you very much for what you're doing. We appreciate it. It's very important. Thank you, Jane. Do we have anyone else online wanting to comment? Uh, nobody else online. Could we um, please cl clarify the question about um, gas? Thank you. Sure. So the current ordinance that staff is working on that we have received direction from council is to focus on new construction only. It's not to say we wouldn't look at existing construction at a time in the future, but the current ordinance is focused on new construction. Thank you. Any other last comments or questions from council? Okay, so that takes us to early oral communications. Um, the City Council values your comments and this 15 minute time period allows people to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. Um, please know that pursuant to the Brown Act, the, count, the council cannot discuss or take action on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. At the end of all oral communications, the council may respond to statements. Supported requests that require council action will be set for a future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers are limited to two minutes. There will also be time for public comment for the public to comment specifically on each agenda item and again at the um, end of the meeting under item number 12. Um, and so again, we will be um, starting with those that are in person. So if you've got numbers one through four, if you could please um, line up and you can just leave your number on the podium when you're done speaking. All right. Good evening, I'm Fred Wise, Honorable Mayor members of the City Council and staff. Um, uh, two things. One, the 3D modeling is here. It's announced on Friday. I um, wish to make everyone aware of it. I wish to thank David Loya, the engineers at GHD, the architect Julian Berg, and everyone who worked on it. It's really great. Uh, the success of it is going to be based upon what staff offers to us, because it's, it's a tool. It's capable of anything and also what the City Council and Planning Com Commission asked of it. I would like to see a build out of what 500 or 1,000 or even 2,000 apartments would look like. Uh, the second item is something which is um, important to me. Um, ever since I read the plan, I've been bothered by something. It may have come up with you previously, but I'm not familiar with it. The area that I call the industrial area from Samoa to 8th Street is called the Barrel District. This is an homage to the former California Barrel Company site where thousands of Arcadians worked. It's instrumental in the war effort in World War II. Um, the quote from the video, which is not the draft plan, it's the video, but it's, uh, it says, this is the formerly the Barrel Manufacturing Plant, at least in its earliest 
days. I um, take objection to that phrase. Uh, I think that with our sensitivity and awareness, our respect for other peoples, uh, that was not the use in its earliest days. And I request that the council find a new phrase to replace Barrel District, that that be used as a placeholder and be put in the past, and we have a new name for that district. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Good evening. I'd like to address the grand jury report that you had at your last meeting that seemed to be quite short amount of time that was spent on that for such an important issue. Um, I would first like to say the wastewater treatment plant is something that has to be addressed and I haven't heard what's happening there. If you go to NOAA's website and look at the increments of between 2 to 12 feet, you can see it like three feet that it actually becomes an island lower lower g and the other side of g gets the plant gets cut off so the city seems to think it's at a much higher level at 11 feet but i think we need somebody who's you know pretty a professional to look into that um, the other issue i'd address it is the grand jury report specifically said that they didn't want anything tall buildings and wetland areas because of sea lot what because of the implications of what can happen um, it seems like with the gateway plan you're actually doing the opposite of what you should be doing from what that report came out you're specifically deciding between four and eight story buildings in the barrel district which is also according to know a, a tsunami zone um, we've also had some professors that have sent letters into the city that from Humboldt State that basically said it's a very unstable uh, land as far as the sediment to build these high rises on. So I'm a little concerned why that wasn't addressed from the city. It seemed like the city's response was very vague and sort of like kicking the can down the road. Um, the other part of it, the grand jury was talking about the the levy system, you know, and I have a feeling that that's where you're going is to increase that. But I'd also say your admission statement when you started out and talking about the native population here, that was one of the biggest things that destroyed the area was building all those levees. So you're sort of like building on the foundation of that, um, which is in a good direction. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, you can just leave the card up there. So. You, no fair taking it home for next time. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. All right, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Dan Barton, an Arcata resident and voter, and I'm actually here tonight solely to ask Councilman Watson to resign or at a bare minimum to gracefully not seek re-election. I feel like the gall or chutzpah really displayed by your decision to seek re-election is an embarrassment to the city. The damage to city staff morale and well-being caused by indisputably corroborated actions and the distraction that this has caused, including what I am doing right now from important city business has hampered progress on important issues, squandered city resources, especially human resources. And I have to say to all the city staff and council members who have continued to serve despite the conditions imposed by Councilman Watson's continued presence, I respect you all immensely. I appreciate your continued service to the city and thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right. Today I'm McGretta. Here it is, the Earth flag. Three years ago, Greta Thunberg sailed across the Atlantic to the United Nations to give her how dare you speech. That was three years ago. The rivers are drying up in Europe. Fires are raging everywhere. Um, mass starvation in many countries and um, this is a old sign I took to many several public meetings and uh, public events uh, this was Greta Thunberg's phrase I want you to panic our house is on fire and now more than ever this is true and it's taking so long for us to really show demonstrable action positive action in making change in our local community and globally um, come september there's going to be the north country fair it's also um, international peace day on the 21st um, it's also the month three years ago where I asked and received um, from the City Council a declaration of a climate emergency. Let us revisit that 
uh, at that date, at that time, and uh, really get specific about what we are going to do. Climate action plan is um, being discussed and prepared, and uh, there's you know the developments of the different neighborhoods in our community. Uh, energy policies, transit policies, we really need to get moving fast on all this. So uh, time is ticking and we don't have a lot of more time because the rivers are drying up and um, life is going to become very difficult for so many people. So let us as Arcata lead the way and show them how we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Okay, moving to online comments next. All right, our first comment is Jane. Go ahead, Jane. Good evening. I will see you there a little later, but at the moment I wanted to first uh, commend the city and city staff for the Ben Noble presentation, uh, which was excellent and helpful. Um, and I would, uh, as I expressed to Jen this afternoon in an email, hope that those results uh, can be made available as soon as possible, um, even before we have, you know, there's time left for other people to add on to it. But um, I think it would be useful if we had that information um, as soon as possible. And David Loya's presentation was excellent. It showed the 3D modeling uh, ability. And I think uh, the more of this kind of thing we can do, the better. Um, I would hope that at our study session that's upcoming, rather than take time to give that presentation, since it's available to all of you, you I'm sure you've watched it, that we actually have a study session where we can talk about the issues rather than have presentations going issue by issue. Um, so I hope that will be the case in the upcoming study session, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Next speaker is Mary. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, okay, where do I start? Well, thank you for allowing me to express my thoughts and concerns this evening. Your attention is greatly appreciated. As a long-term resident of Humboldt County and currently, uh, um, pardon me, and current community member of Arcata, I feel I must make my thoughts and concerns regarding the Gateway Project heard. I recently moved into the four-story Dankel building located on 7th and I Streets, believing that doing so would benefit me by providing much needed affordable housing. Prior to moving in, I would not considered how living with over 100 people cramped within a four-story apartment building would be like. My experience here at 969 7th Street has been, night has been nightmarish, as my privacy and feelings of well-being have been replaced by growing concerns and dissatisfaction. Living in such close proximity with so many other people has not proved to be a positive experience. I love our town. And living in Arcata has always been an exceptional experience until recently due to the need for additional housing. While I support providing additional housing for our new and long-term residents and our university students to come, I am also fearful that a building, that building an eight-story structure housing over 100, pardon me, I'm also fearful that building an eight-story structure housing over 100 of apartment dwellers will inevitably cause social unrest actually hundreds of apartment dwellers, pardon me, will inevitably, inevitably cause social unrest by both the building residents and the nearby, nearby neighbors. My experience has proven to me that living with 100 people in a small area fosters poor behavior on the part of the residents and the surrounding community. In the short months I've lived at 969 7th Street, 7th Street, I have witnessed and experienced such antisocial behaviors as ongoing illegal trespassing, garbage dumping, um, breaking. Mary, that's your that's your two minutes. But if you'd like to finish your statement at the end of the meeting, we will have another opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's no other online oral communications. Okay, we do have a few minutes left in that 15 minute time period. So I would say if there's two more folks that would like to speak on something that are not on the agenda that are here in person, you can make your way to the podium. Uh, 
Um, hi, uh, Jim Becker. Um, hello to staff and to council members. Uh, thanks for having I just figured I'd take these two minutes since we have them and I don't really prepare anything, but just to once again put a pitch in for the L Street uh, Linear Park and all of the benefits that might come from it. And that'll really be about it. Um, and I think I've spoken enough on it that I, I've probably covered it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here? Everybody's been so brief this evening, we have extra time, so. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on then. So that takes us to the consent calendar and all matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the city council and are enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of any of these items. If discussion is required, the, that item is removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. At the end of the reading of the consent calendar, council members or members of the public can request that an item be removed for separate discussion. We have item A, a biweekly report on disbursements. Item B, adopt resolution number 223-15, accepting a conservation easement on a portion of assessor's parcel number 503-271-028, adjacent to the Arcata Community Forest. We have item C, which is adopt resolution number 223-16, accepting a fee title interest in a portion of assessor's, assessor's parcel number 507-131-091 from Eureka Ready Mix Concrete Company Incorporated. D is adopt resolution number 223-05, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Arcata authorizing application for a, coastal, a California Coastal Commission planning grant. E, approve a purchase contract with Western Global for two above ground stationary fuel storage tanks and two standard duty pump kits for a total contract price of $67,691.41, including tax and freight, and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. F, amend the existing bike share program with Tandem Mobility LLC to add four additional stations in the city limits for the contract amount not to exceed $36,000 per program year. Authorize the city engineer to increase the amount by up to $9,000 for a total of $45,000 to allow for installation of an additional bike station if funding becomes available. And authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. G, adopt resolution number 223-13, stating the city's intent to reimburse expenditures by the State Water Resources Control Board made in support of the city's infiltration and inflow reduction project. And resolution number 223-14, authorizing the city manager to file a financial assistance application with the State Water Resources Control Board for the city's infiltration and inflow reduction project. Okay, that's the end. Are there any items that council members would like pulled? <clears throat> I'd like to pull item F, please. I'm sorry, what was that? Item F. Do we have any others? Okay, is there anyone from um, staff or a member of the public that would like to pull an item? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, um, Council Member Watson did pull F. Yeah, yeah, just F. Any others besides None F? None online. Okay, so can I have a motion on A through G with the exception of F? Sure, I'd like to make a motion um, to approve items A, B, C, D, E, N, G of the inconsent calendar. And hold. Can we hold for just, oh, go ahead and second, Sarah. I'll second. Okay. Um, Alex does have her hand up. So I was I don't going know. to second the motion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do, um, do we have um, any public comment on these items? No? Okay. Um, so let's go I, 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 May I say one thing? I, I'm really pleased to see that we have item number, um, the co item D, and that we're able to go forward with the Coastal Commission and be able to get a grant for that. And I believe it's really going to be important for us to have one LCP in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, actually, I think these bike share programs are great. I have been out and about a lot in the last couple of weeks and I actually have seen people on those bikes. So that's great. I just wanna make sure that we budgeted for this item. Uh, yes, and this is fully funded via grant, all the new four stations. 
Um, is this the same company that um, that currently has spots on the plaza? Yes. And then, um, so we have two on the plaza right now? Yes. So then we'll be have four total? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, two in plaza, that was right, a question, and two in at yeah. uh, Cal Poly okay. Humboldt. Okay. And we'll add four more. Okay, great. I'm glad to see the program successful enough to uh, yeah, to, to drive expansion of it. So thank you. Okay, all in favor? It, it, oh, would, yeah. it would be kind of awesome if we could find some way to maybe advertise that they're around. So I don't know, maybe through social media or something. That yeah, once we have those four stations, we'll do a PSA and we'll encourage um, students and uh, community members to use that um, bike chair program. That's we we are. I'm about yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> all right. That's oh, that's why you gave me the funny look. Okay, so we're. I didn't catch that. Okay, so for items A through G minus F, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 And was that an aye from Council Member Stillman? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, the very popular and letter F. So I'll make a motion to approve item F. I'll second. Okay, is there any pu um, public input on item F? In the front row, I'm having a hard time hearing people. So please, for those of us a little hard of hearing, speak into the mic, eat it, eat the mic. Um, uh, bicycles, uh, bicycle things that you can borrow um, is what I'm understanding. We're getting more of them, that's great. As I've mentioned before, and I've talked to Netra a little bit about, um, we are such a car-oriented society still. So parking slots around the plaza and in parking lots at uh, co-ops and um, Uniontown and all that. Let's start um, thinking about allowing bicycles to park in those slots because for me, I have a big, huge trike, and other people have cargo bikes or bikes with trailers, and we're oftentimes just really shoved in a corner. And if we're going to have um, people renting bikes, oftentimes I've seen in the past people <laughs> leaving those bikes just like right out in the open. It's almost like a hazard. So we need to evolve quickly into whatever vehicle you are driving, pedaling, um, scooting on, whatever, you know, you can be able to park in a slot where a car normally was the only thing that could park there. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is the revolution that needs to happen in Arcata. So I just want to say that in addition to, great, we're giving people opportunity to rent bikes, but let's give them an opportunity to park them safely and uh, successfully wherever they're intending to take them. So thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Any other public input on item F? There's one online. Go ahead, Greg. Hi, yeah, Greg King. Um, thanks. I just want to actually echo uh, what Joanne said uh, in that we do need, I think, some uh, high-quality covered um, bike lockers and perhaps even little um, bike uh, parking garages, if you will, just dry, secure, um, you know, if you build it, they will come sort of thing. We're really not going to get more people onto bikes and more pedestrians until it becomes safer and, and they're not going to lose their bikes. Um, so that's all I have to say. I, I really would push for funding uh, and exploration of how to expand our infrastructure. Because again, there are a lot of people such as myself who will not ride most of the time and in most places because it's increasingly dangerous. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next comment is Anthony. Go ahead, Anthony. Hi, um, I'm appreciating everybody's comments about bikes and how to get people to use them more and something strikes me is a solution is a mixed residential with grocery you know kind of like the thing that arcade has had 
is to have some grocery stores and residential all mixed together in the same area instead of population density. That's just an idea. I wanted to throw it out there, and that's good. Thank you. No more online. Okay. Um, my name's Dan Close. Mm -hmm. and I had a friend who was recently involved in a bicycle accident that sent him to the hospital. And it was caused by using common sense, trying to use a bike, and uh, the design of traffic calming uh, measures, which I've seen come in place since we got here. Um, I'm proposing that um, we're still accommodating cars way too much. And I get it, enforcement doesn't work, so make it curvy and, you know, make it, uh, slow it down, take away lanes, take, move things. Well, he was coming from the farmer's market to the community center to lower Sunny Bray. And he was traveling, um, uh, his name's Curtis Jacoby. He was traveling, and he's got a planning background and other stuff, but he was traveling on the wrong side, in the wrong direction, uh, for a reason. It doesn't make sense to go through the traffic circle to enter, enter traffic and go around that and then go on the correct side. And he was probably in the pedestrian um, part of the division, and there was a willow branch hanging out low that knocked him off his bicycle and uh, because it wasn't trimmed and it was growing because of the riparian area. And uh, it knocked him off of his bicycle and he landed on the barrier, which is um, concrete curb, stepped up. And he landed and he hit his front and back ribs, broke about eight, nine ribs. Um, and uh, went unconscious from pain, was transported by ambulance to the hospital. And uh, the, it's a direct cause of a, a well-intentioned traffic calming measure, which puts pedestrians and um, cars and everyone at risk. Now the idea is if somebody's buzzed or drunk, they're just gonna drive fast if it's straight and then an accident's gonna happen. Well giving them an obstacle course as people age, you know, curves and all these other things. And um, creating, you know, the, the roundabouts are great. Europe's so far ahead of us. They had them before we ever got them. Australia, everywhere I traveled, you know, it, and people freak out that all of a sudden it's not a stop sign, but basically um, change the name to Carcata or change the name to Union or do something to make this safer for everyone. Because this progressive planning thing is backfiring like you wouldn't believe it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and we are sorry about your friend. Okay, I don't believe, oh, we, we, do we have a motion and a second on? All right, we do, so let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor of item, uh, number letter F. <laughs> Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Motion passes. Next, we have um, old business. And the item in this section is receive an update on the city of Arcata's wastewater and water infrastructure planning. And we've got um, Environmental Services Director Emily Sinkhorn with a staff report. Certainly. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, I'm just going to need a quick minute to get a presentation pulled up and I trying to be patient with getting this pulled up our keyboard likes patient typing <laughs> this is what we've learned yeah. so I'll just uh, start talking um, so we appreciate um, the opportunity to give an um, update on how the city has been planning for water and wastewater infrastructure, both um, for current projects and planning for the future. And water and wastewater, water distribution and treatment and wastewater collection and treatment is some of the key essential services 
the um, city provides and environmental services staff are involved in the maintenance and operations um, of those essential services and we partner across the city particularly with engineering to plan design and make um, projects happen so thank you for your patience um, so just as a reminder, how does the city plan for any larger capital project? Most of our water and wastewater projects are take multiple years of planning and are a um, heavy investment. And so um, any infrastructure planning, the city really refers to our capital improvement program or our CIP. And um, this is brought to um, the council and the planning commission every year. And so this is one of the main ways we're really planning for the future and systematically looking to plan design and then finance these larger projects. And so I just wanted to pull out and highlight um, the multiple water and wastewater projects that are a part of the capital improvement program. And I think um, we have about 10 highlighted here and they make up kind of a bit less than half of our total um, CIP projects, but um, definitely way more than half of our um, intended and um, anticipated costs. So this is um, key investments for the city. So the first um, project really wanted to focus on is giving a, a brief update of the status of the Arcata Wastewater Treatment Facility Phase 1 um, upgrade. And so planning for this critical project um, has been in the works for well over a decade. Um, it really will be the largest capital project the city has ever um, undertaken. Um, it is currently um, out to bid and we anticipate receiving um, bids from contractors um, tomorrow. So it's a, it's a pivotal moment. Um, it is an exciting moment. Um, and so really, how did we get here? Um, a critical decision point um, was after the city and um, contractor and consultants um, worked on a facilities plan that really outlined what the options could be to rehab our current um, facility. And those focused on um, multiple options of retaining our treatment plant facilities with the natural system in place where we are. Um, retaining our natural system and augmenting um, the treatment plant capacity with a parallel mechanical system within the core area of the plant. Um, also looking at um, potential uh, relocation and looking at all those pros and cons. And so at the time, um, the council really looked at those options and heard from the community um, and made a decision to really focus the um, rehab on our existing um, treatment plant and to retain the natural systems um, and also plan for a parallel mechanical system as a phase two um, that could plan for the future, for future capacity and um, give us uh, give the city options if the upgrades planned for the natural system in phase one didn't meet all of our kind of water quality um, improvement goals. Um, so once that decision was made, a lot of planning really began in earnest and design. Um, and so again, the, the key um, purpose of the phase one upgrade is to replace a lot of our aging infrastructure from the 1980s. Um, to upgrade our disinfection system, we currently use chlorine um, to ultraviolet um, light. And that was a, as a big step as um, a lot of our um, water quality uh, challenges stem from um, disinfection byproducts from using chlorine. UV is also a lot safer um, of having chlorine gas um, much more you know, stored at the, at the plant. Um, and this, uh, the scope of this project um, will also reconfigure to a single pass flow of how influent flows into the plant and is treated through all of the processes and then exits at a new outfall in the Brackish Marsh um, north of the Gearhart Enhancement Marsh. Um, and so just again to reiterate the uh, continuing for the purpose, um, is really to better meet our water qu quality standards. Um, 
I've talked about eliminating byproducts from our chlorine disinfection and to really retain the beneficial reuse of our um, influent coming into the plant to uh, through our enhancement marshes and uh, maintaining that beneficial reuse to protect um, coastal resources. So um, I know this is, this is an overview um, of the treatment plant upgrade for phase one. It may be hard to see both in person um, and online, but the dark uh, black lines detail the key improvements for phase one. Um, a lot of those are a lot of our piping and ducting and um, pumps that have um, been working well uh, for the city for many decades, but are a maintenance challenge. And those are um, throughout the core treatment area, the oxidation ponds, as well as out to the um, enhancement marshes. Um, other um, key upgrades includes upgrades to the headworks, um, which is where the influent um, comes into the core area of the treatment plant. Upgrades to the primary clarifier, which helps to separate um, solids and liquids from the um, from the uh, influent. Um, also, the addition of 24 aerators in oxidation um, pond two. Um, and that is really, uh, again, intended to um, increase um, you know, the opportunity for seeing some of the water quality um, benefits we hope to see in that natural system and having that aeration really augment that. Um, so this will be a, a large project of once it gets started, which we anticipate to be this fall of a duration of about 30 months. So there will be ongoing um, impacts to our ongoing operations at the treatment plant and corporation yard. And we've been actively planning for that. And that is a key component of ensuring that our um, treatment um, system can um, continue even during construction. Um, as well as there will be temporary um, impacts to the public access portions of the marsh. Um, and that is not anticipated um, to start until 2023, likely in the spring, and will be kind of well noticed um, to the public. Um, but those are the, um, those will be some temporary impacts um, just to enable this critical project to move forward. So I touched on the timeline um, a bit. Our contractor bids are due tomorrow. Um, currently, the um, UV system is being fabricated. Um, and so that is in process. We have all of the uh, permits for the project, except our coastal development permit, um, which is anticipated um, to be at the September hearing of the Coastal Commission. And um, we, have, um, we have heard that staff will be recommending approval of the project. Um, and again, will be about a 30-month 30, 30 time period. So just wanted to briefly um, touch on sea level rise and the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project. Um, a key thing is that planning for sea level rise for this project, other projects within the city are consistent with um, the city's local coastal program planning. Um, and in particular, um, utilizing the same data and strategies and analysis um, that were presented to the council at the last kind of study session for the LCP. Um, a key thing um, that city staff and our consultants um, from of, of experts around sea level rise planning um, have really determined that the phase one project will be viable throughout its 30-year um, design life, so through to 2055, um, without um, additional um, levy augmentation. Um, however, we aren't just planning for those 30 years, um, and we're planning into the future. And so incremental levy augmentation of the core area of the treatment plant is being um, pursued. And in this year's budget, the council approved um, funding for planning um, and design. And we are um, will soon be releasing a um, request for proposals for assistance um, in that um, phase of the project. Um, and then our engineering department uh, recently received the, the great news that our um, 
our grant proposal to FEMA and Cal OES um, was successfully um, funded to see us through um, through construction, and so we um, anticipate that um, that. Uh, that levy augmentation for that core area of the treatment plant um, will be, you know, will occur in then within several years. Um, I guess one thing I didn't touch on um, for ensuring that, um, just in our analysis, that phase one um, will be protected from sea level rise without, even if the city was not, um, you know, working on levy augmentation in that area, is the mechanical systems and electrical components of the new facilities that are are coming in will be, you know, protected from flooding and um, with raised elevations, and also that our um, enhancement marshes are able to weather um, more um, times of in a temporary inundation. Um, so we have also, staff have received questions around the current capacity of the treatment plant or what will our capacity be with um, phase one completed, um, and then what about future capacity? So I just wanted to have um, a couple slides focused uh, on that. Um, when we think about capacity of a treatment facility, there's a number of parameters to think about capacity. It's how much influent can come into the plant um, per day at an instantaneous amount of time, um, how much can individual processes, how much flow can individual processes take, um, also of how much flow can the plant take during the wet season you know, versus the dry, um, also how much uh, nutrient loading a treatment plant can handle, also um, if the you know, influent meets a, a flow really meets our permit limits um, with uh, the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board as we have a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. Um, so right now I'm just going to focus on influent flow because um, that's one of the um, one way to really look at capacity and, and grasp. Um, and so go going to be showing some numbers but want to talk about what each of these um, per, uh, columns mean. And so this first current values for design, um, that those were current, those were values kind of um, taken from a snapshot of 12 years when the city was working on the design for phase one. So um, looking at those 12 years, what were the kind of current um, average amounts uh, of influent flow um, into the plant, the future values was what the um, phase one design was really planning for. And that was really based on the current values plus a 20% growth factor as a kind of factor of safety as influent flow can vary as at that time. Um, we were planning for about 1% um, of growth uh, per year. And so this was looking at a 20, um, 20 30 year time frame and planning for um, what at the time was in our general plan. Um, and tw the 2021 values are from you know last year's average values, and then our permit limits um, with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, also, um, so we're going to be looking at our units of million gallons per day of influent coming into the plant. Um, and then again, there's many ways to look at this. So we'll look at minimum flow, average dry weather flow, uh, maximum month flow. These are all key um, parameters to keep in mind um, and to look at before we look at some of that data. So let's look at some of that data. And there, so there, there's a lot to you know take in here. But a key thing to note um, is that our kind of average dry weather flow last year was um, 1.0 million gallons per day. Um, you know, the treatment plant when phase um, one is complete um, will have a you know, much greater capacity um, than that. Um, also, again, seeing that our um, peak instantaneous flow at the bottom can be quite large, and that's really dependent upon the amount of precipitation, the timing of precipitation, um, the amount of inflow and infiltration coming into our wastewater collection system. And in the past uh, few years, we have not had a, a, a wet, very wet, wet season. 
Um, so that is something that for future planning will really continue to be looking at the range of years and not just instantaneously at, in 2021. But wanted to give you kind of a bit of where we are where we are at. And so, um, so just looking at data from 2021, our average dry weather flow, um, you know, is less than 50% of our capacity. Um, and then for average wet weather flow, it was definitely was more of a third of that capacity. And it's the wet weather flow is what we really, um, is the most challenging to plan for. And we'll talk about more how we can um, also uh, reduce, you know, that amount of wet weather flow coming into the plant. But just wanted to give that, um, that snapshot. Um, this table is just another Excuse way. Me, Emily, can we go back yes. to that? Can I just ask a quick, quick question Please. about those bottom, two rows there because it kind of is making sense to me on the top ones you know the, the this one's smaller and then we add 20 percent for growth and then looking at that but for the peak wet weather those are the same and for the peak flow capacity i mean just what why are those the same and yeah. you know yeah. without a 20 percent growth or is that just I, I don't know just explain those last two lines i guess a little bit more yeah, sure so just for the peak so. um wet weather flow um the main uh, limitation there is our NPDS permit um, limit, um, and that is really to ensure that our treatment plant has the capacity not only to take in influent, but then to treat that influent, and especially around nutrient loading. Um, for the peak instantaneous flow, we can have more flow coming in to the plant that then um, is stored and attenuated in the oxidation ponds if we like can't send it right through the whole system um, right away and so we have that additional capacity for storage but there those the 16.5 numbers are really the likely the same because many of our um, uh, processes that work through the headworks that brings in the influent and in the clarifier have kind of max um, flow amounts that they can really operate. That helps answer your question. Um, this is just another way to look at the data. Um, so again, the yellow is our 2021 values. The gray is our permit limits. The red is what our design um, capacity is for phase one. Um, and then the blue has been what, you know, we're past, um, infl uh, past inflow um, that we really were using to plan for design. So I just want to clarify, uh, you know, this is a 30 year plan basically, right? So 2050 and um, with a 20% growth factor. So we're, Basically, this is all based off of the assumption that in 2050, the city will only grow by 4,000 people. Yeah, so this current, um, this current phase one, the 20% growth factor, um, you can relate it to population, but it was not looking at a 20% population growth. The goal was really to plan for the um, population that at that time we were planning for in the 2000 um, um, general plan. And um, so the what we're planning for for the future, so phase one will be viable throughout that time, but it's not where we're stopping for planning for 2055. And so we'll talk about what we're planning for future capacity, but this current um, phase one is really to ensure that our current residents and planning into the future have a viable wastewater treatment plant. And that's why it's so imperative because we have that aging infrastructure so and I'll then, touch more on that the future okay. capacity those are helpful questions any other questions just to reclarify that point so so we're looking phase phase one is looking at basically then you know what we needed to do to make it work for for now for the people that are here and then now you're gonna go into phase two which is for future growth yeah, we'll, okay. we'll touch on what um, we've been calling as phase as phase two, and then what um, we've been calling a phase three. 
No, phase one is now plus 20 percent, right? Yeah, phase okay. one is now um, plus, plus um, you know, that 20 percent sort of growth factor. Um, and when we were designing, when the city was designing for phase one, um, it was also really designing at the same time pre-design with phase two. Um, and we'll talk about that um, in the next next slide. Um, so just briefly to touch on the, um, you know, again, I just focused on influent flow capacity. Um, the effluent limitations for nutrient loading are another key um, aspect of capacity. Um, and really a lot of phase one is really focused on um, that aspect. And that has been a challenge for our natural system. Um, not all or not many treatment plants utilize the natural system that um, we do. And we're really grateful to um, our partners and longstanding collaborators to assist in um, options for working with our really unique and innovative system. Um, we have implemented um, eight aerators um, in our oxidation ponds just in this last year. They've been up and running um, since uh, the end of May and June. Um, so we anticipate um, soon with our partners at um, Amory and city staff of analyzing for um, biological oxygen demand and other um, you know, nutrient loading parameters that we hope to see some, um, some real improvements and um, just with, with those aerators and we're planning again 24 in the phase one. Um, so then for briefly on the future capacity planning for the, when the city was in the pre-design phase and facility planning phase, when the council at the time chose to um, retain the natural system, um, they also um, had, you know, voted on a phase two that would be more of a parallel mechanical system within the core part of the treatment um, facility such that if our goals for water quality weren't completely met with phase one that um, we could phase in a oxidation ditch which is a you know artificial not uh, like our oxidation pond that is more of a natural system but within a more um, contained built um, system and also for updates to uh, adding a secondary clarifier and other aspects um, that would enable to, to augment the treatment of the natural system. And so um, the city had been uh, planning to start that design of phase two um, last year and our funding partner, the state um, water board had asked for phase two to be put on hold temporarily um, and has is funding um, a technical assistance um, for more of a, a third party feasibility study to plan for long range um, for what may be um, um, the best for the treatment plant um, in Arcata that um, we are anticipating that that feasibility study could start um, this fall um, and would hopefully commence this year um, and complete in 2023. Um, they have really asked um, for that feasibility study to look at more of the, the future beyond 2055. Um, I th really anticipate that a lot of those analyses will be similar to what the city has um, already conducted in our um, facilities plan. But it would also um, look at um, what could be some um, you know, relocation or additional treatment facilities outside of our core treatment plant area and weigh, um, weigh those pros and cons, particularly of the infrastructure um, investment that we have currently in place. And also with our, um, with our plan um, for uh, resilience to sea level rise um, and just of putting the, all those pieces together which a lot of that has really been um, is being accomplished through our local coastal planning um, effort currently. Um, so also around capacity and, and projects that the city is currently undertaking um, is what we can look at how can we um, increase capacity at the plant itself and we can also look at how can we decrease the amount of influent coming into the plant. 
Um, and so one of the key ways to do that is to really look at reducing um, inflow and infiltration into our sewer collection system. So that can be from direct connections into our sewer um, system. It can also be from groundwater seeping into um, leaking pipes. Um, and also um, another another way that the city has been addressing this in, is in 2017, um, the city adopted the sewer lateral um, replacement um, ordinance, um, and that really targets whenever a um, a residence is being sold that is over 25 years. It requires a um, a certificate um, that that lateral is intact, um, has been cleaned, or needs to be replaced. Um, and we are really seeing results um, from these projects. Um, so a recently completed INI project, Inflow and Infiltration, um, preliminary re results from, 20, from the 2019 project um, indicate that the wet weather flows into the plant have been reduced um, by 0.5 million gallons per day during the wet season. So if we think about um, back to the table that we were looking at, and in 2021, our, um, I mean, let's not make it up numbers, let's, let's look at it. Um, you know, so our peak instantaneous flow in the winter last year was 4.7. Um, you know, our average um, wet weather flow was, you know, was under 2 uh, million gallons per day. But the decrease of 0.5 million gallons um, per day through this project is not insignificant. And um, the your council, just on the consent calendar, um, approved uh, moving forward with um, this next INI project um, that our engineering department is um, currently really focused on. So we anticipate that um, that next project to occur in the next uh, few years. A lot of that is lining of um, sewer pipes and is a multi-million you know, uh, dollar effort. So for other projects, um, we have a man annual manhole and sewer line rehabilitation projects. Again, mostly um, lining of manholes and sewer lines where we budget about 150,000 annually. Um, we also, um, our engineering department is you know, leading um, pump replacement at the First Street lift station, and that is at Rotary Park on South G. And this um, lift station is really important um, during the wet season and really pumps a lot of the collection um, um, that is coming from the uh, Sunny Bray and Eastern um, part of the city. So that is um, an overview of kind of current wastewater and future wastewater um, infrastructure planning. Um, and then I could go into um, water planning briefly um, or take any um, questions now. I have just a couple slides on water. I was just going to ask if anyone had an opinion on that, if we want to stop and ask questions or just let Emily finish. All right, okay, go ahead. Great. Um, so for drinking water um, planning, again, we are, we are very fortunate of where um, we live on the North Coast um, to have a um, robust um, water capacity. So the city is a municipal uh, member of the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District, and we um, receive our water um, through the water district, um, which comes from the Mad River, and um, the you know storage is at Ruth Lake in Trinity County on the Mad River, and um, it is currently at 94% um, percent of capacity. Um, and in 2020, the city utilized about a little more than half of its um, right, um, which is 1,186 million gallons of water um, annually. Um, and the city and um, through our urban water management plan and the, the water district through their planning um, really looked at what is you know in the future for Arcata's drinking water needs um, and anticipate you know even in the next 20 years perhaps we would use about 60 percent of that water right so just to keep that in context for what the city has um, available 
Um, the city also has an auxiliary groundwater well um, that is at Hinden Road um, on the west side of 101 near um, where 299 and uh, Giantoli come in. Um, it, it has been offline for several years and that was through um, the state's water conservation um, st standards or um, requirements um, that came in since in 2014 or 2015. Um, we are in currently and right in the middle of um, ensuring that final well tests um, to get that back up. So that is a, another water source. And so uh, that can withdraw up to 0.5 million gallons per day. So it's, it's great to have that um, as an additional water source or backup water source. And um, we can get all the water we want, but we also need to store it and have it available for, um, for when, uh, when we need it and when you turn on the faucet. So the city maintains 16 water storage tanks um, and we have many different zones um, within the city where these tanks are located and serve different elevational uh, areas of the city. Um, we have a current project um, that has recently been um, awarded to a contractor. We'll start very soon um, and it has funding through our infill and, in, uh, infill and infrastructure grant program and also through um, the city's um, water fund. Um, and that is a million gallon um, steel, new steel tank um, that will be tank 1C. It will um, provide water to the pressure zone 1 which is the majority of the population in Arcata and it will increase increase our water storage by 20%. So that's a, a key, um, key number both for resiliency um, in case of you know, damage to the water distribution line from the district, in case of fire, in case of many um, you know, emergency planning needs. Um, I was going to say one more thing about that. And, but other uh, water infrastructure projects. Um, Environmental services and, and engineering have been working um, for several years to outline a next water line replacement project. Um, we have a lot of older and AC pipes um, that are getting soft and can spring leaks. We've um, really identified where a lot of those priority needs are um, and are working to get our you know, funding package and um, all of our permits and design in line for um, completing that in the next couple years. So that will be a large project um, and also currently in the Jacoby Creek Water District where the city um, provides um, the water service to that district. Um, we have a Cal OES funded um, project to, for improvements at a booster station and water lines. So that's a quick overview of um, kind of the current planning for water infrastructure. And I'm happy to take any questions um, for water and wastewater planning and also city engineer Nature Khatri is here as well, especially for any more technical questions. Right. Thank you, Director St. Corn. We appreciate that. So I'm sure that we've all have lots of questions. So I would just maybe um, if each council member could ask a few whenever it's your turn and then kind of pass it along and then we'll come back and pick up others um, just so we can spread it out. Um, so whoever would like to start first. No, I was just going to say those last couple slides were really interesting about water storage. So thank you. But um, I was going to ask just because I know you know, a lot of these projections about sea level rise can change kind of rapidly and that, you know, I think that we are in a way different situation than maybe the council back in 2017 was making decisions for. But um, my overarching question is kind of just, it's, it's two pronged. I feel like I ask really long questions, but, um, you know, because you said phase two is kind of on hold right now to, to look at feasibility um, and, and to kind of, you know, make sure that is the right call and just thinking, you know, is the Coastal Commission in agreement, you know, with with us about believing that, you know, we, we have capacity up to 2055 and that going ahead with phase two will most likely happen and just, um, yeah, how's the Coastal Commission feel about it? <laughs> Yeah, so for the last um, many, many months, um, uh, multiple 
great staff um, in ES and engineering, Deputy Director Emily Benvy, Rachel Hernandez, our environmental compliance officer, um, Jessica Jewett, um, our project manager, have really been leading, um, also Doby Class, retired annuitant, um, have really been leading the technical aspects um, for how we make our case for the project with um, Coastal Commission staff. And fortunately, um, Coastal Commission staff have been um, really um, responsive and um, really of uh, direct and easy to work with um, because they have had a lot of questions um, both technical and clarifying um, and also of really asking for more information to back up our analysis so that has been um, a many month iteration of um, submittals over this past year um, and in May or June um, I think it was May we received um, a note that our like app our application, you know, materials, you know, were deemed um, complete. Um, and then that Coastal Commission staff um, would review those. Um, we have received, um, you know, a verbal note that our um, the staff will be recommending approval of the project with um, specific conditions. Um, again, they've been really um, helpful to work with as uh, we've had the construction project um, out to bid. And some of the, um, we wanted to make sure that we could, uh, as much as we could understand what some of the suggested um, conditions would be around construction and what a contractor would need to do. Um, and fortunately, we were able to receive those, um, what staff will be recommending as conditions around construction. Um, so that's a long answer to say that the commission staff have been um, very helpful to work with, will be recommending approval, um, and the commission will be hearing that project in September. Um, and so around, so that is that is for phase one. Um, and what was not um, included in phase one um, was levy augmentation, because um, we really showed the project would be viable um, without that. We are planning um, as a separate project, the levy augmentation, as I talked about with the FEMA funding. Um, and as uh, nature has really uh, said that our kind of the most um, difficult aspect of that project was getting um, funding. It was, you know, finding funding, you know, probably won't be permitting. Um, and so after several years of, of um, really trying to get that project funded just you know this last month received word that it, it was funded um, the Coastal Commission has approved um, emergency levy um, work um, to the city in the past um, eight years or I think about eight years ago and that augmented the um, levies uh, several inches. Um, we have in the planning for phase one um, that initially included levy augmentation, um, multiple reasons that was pulled um, pulled out. So the commission is aware of our um, strategy that is, again, is consistent with our local coastal program um, planning as well. And so for permitting for phase um, two. Um, most of that work um, will really be within the core treatment plant area um, themselves. And so the, um, you know, the potential to affect coastal resources, which is what the Coastal Commission would be looking at, um, would really, would, would probably be on levy augmentation. So as we move that project forward, some of those questions will likely be answered and addressed um, in that levy augmentation project before we even get to phase two. Excellent. That was that was a great answer. Um, thank you, Emily. Um, and then the other question I was going to ask, uh, just could you give a little, just a brief more overview about phase two and kind of how the oxidation ditches increase capacity and kind of what, what role that will play in, in increasing our capacity? Yeah, um, so phase two would also add a secondary clarifier, could also um, um, help in some of the rehab of our existing digester. Um, and so for how phase one and phase two were, were split, um, I wouldn't say phase two was just about increasing capacity. It was also just of how we could fund um, 
and kind of break apart kind of those two phases. Um, but the oxidation ditches um, would be located in that core treatment plant area um, near where the new electrical building um, will be. That slide was too small to really talk about it. Um, and oxidation ditches are like built up uh, con they're not really ditches as much as like swimming pools that are concrete and above ground um, and provide that um, type of aeration um, in a much more mechanical way than the um, oxidation ponds do. Um, they also, um, phase two was intended to have um, build one oxidation ditch if needed um, and see how that functions and then could also be, you know, could add a, a second you know, or a third um, if needed. Thank you. Um, that's all for now. I'll let somebody else ask some questions. Um, how long have you been here? Like one to two years? Um, I have been here since May of um, last year. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, the rate at which you've brought yourself up to speed on some of our complex projects is really impressive. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, are, will the packet information, or I'm sorry, will the slideshow be in the final packet? Could we put that in the packet? That'd be great. Um, does, just because there's like, you know, pictures and stuff in there that I think would yeah. be helpful. Um, so yeah, you 30 months. So basically, uh, so this says that the approval for the CDP is August 2022, but you said that it's um, September. Yeah, so, so it has been a moving target, okay. um, and but we now have received that it will be received from uh, staff, the notice that it will be on the September hearing. Okay. And then 30 months is like, it's basically like 2025. Yeah, so that is what we're um, in anticipating construction going for 30 months, so nearly three years. Um, and so again, that was our, um, the design life sort of starting at, you know, 2025 um, being that, that start date. There will be, um, it'll be an exciting time um, with our staff learning a new, um, a new plant um, and there, there will be a lot of that operational support, um, but it, it is, this is a big endeavor um, and a lot of will all be learning as it um, continues and um, and feel we have um, supportive construction management um, contractor on board um, and it will be a big team effort. Um, and then when it talks about the facilities plan that was completed in 2017, that was, is that, that included phase one and two? Um, that what they weren't called those phases yet. Um, I think there were four options. Originally, um, it was like one big project, but then we broke it up into two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Definitely. And what the facilities plan outlined was four options, and then the council at the time chose the option of retaining the natural system and having this um, option for a parallel mechanical system within the core area. Okay. Um, so yeah, and so in 2017, you know, I'm just thinking that uh, I don't think the we had even thought about the gateway area plan yet. Um, I don't think it was a thing yet um, when we did that planning. And then also, you know, Humboldt didn't be, you know, we didn't know they were going to become a Cal Poly and want to add, you know, seven or eight thousand students. Um, so yeah, it's just something that's like you know come to mind that some of this original planning. Um, I don't know, you know, if we need to update it or reassess it to, to kind of take account for, um, you know, potential growth of uh, development in the gateway area, um, you know, expansion by Cal Poly. Yeah. Um, and then... I'm happy to speak to that yeah, briefly please, if you'd like. Um, so yes, so that's why phase one is so critical and important to um, to have this re have project happen and happen efficiently and be able to um, really uh, meet the needs of our, our current population and what is heading towards the future. Um, our, we have the feasibility study that our funding partner with the State Water Board um, you know, ha is funding, and that will be looking at our new um, population projections. Um, also, any phase two planning we will do will also be looking at, you know, we're not, we won't just be planning for and, and designing for um, 
you know what we have now um, I think it's clear that there will be a that we need a plan for a phase three I hadn't used phase three um, but we've really been thinking about this phase three as what could be the results of this feasibility study for um, what we need to plan into the future um, Phase two, um, again, uh, reiterating that it was really pre-designed with phase one for them to work in concert with one another. Um, and so I could see of, you know, after a bit of phase one operating, if um, the data is really showing, yes, we need to move forward with another oxidation ditch. You know, I, I think um, what encompasses phase two, you know, could, could change. It just that is currently what is envisioned plus we're doing that planning for the future. That's just a follow up on that. So when do you, th I know you said some, I heard you say 2023, I don't, like when will we know the results of this feasibility and be able to kind of more tangibly know what direction we need to go with these phases? <laughs> yeah, I would say we really anticipate more at the end of 2023. Um, that is what um, we've really been um, talking with state water board staff um, about and that would, be helpful, you know, that'll still be when we're in the construction for phase one, um, and we know we need to move forward on what's our next step um, for design. So that's our, that's the goal right now, end of 2023. Um, and then, yeah, just like coming back to this, uh, that phase one and phase two combined, you know, originally planned to, to be viable through 2050 um, with this projected, 20% growth factor. Um, yeah, I guess it's, so it seems like originally, you know, even, I mean, it sounds like there's some hope that with a phase two, that it, it could potentially expand the capacity. Um, but I, I also know that um, like a couple years ago when I talked to one of the engineers on the, working on the design, uh, he had said that it's possible that a phase two won't add to the capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, taking keeping in mind that growth we just talked about uh, with development in the gateway area and in Humboldt, um, you know, like let's just say the gateway area only ends up just to be conservative, it only ends up to be four thousand people, and then Humboldt wants to add, let's just say like seven thousand because that seems conservative for Humboldt. So you know, it's eleven thousand people, um, and I don't know what the time frame would be for that. Would that be thirty years? Would that go to twenty yeah. fifty? Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to kind of like make it line up, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, the key thing is that city staff um, are not thinking of the treatment plant project as, as static. It's like we've, we're like all hands on deck to get phase one started, um, but it's that's not the, that's not the end. Um, and so that's what the future planning, that's what we're, you know, kind of thinking about every day um, and are putting, um, you know, the resources to with our funding partner. Um, so it's, that is what we're, continually doing okay and then yeah and then again it depends on it sounds like phase one is going to be fine but um it depends on uh how acceptable phase two is to the state water quality control board and the california coastal commission yeah and i mean i think also we'll learn more during that yeah, during the well during the phase one from the feasibility study from what we're um just you know, learning as a city on our own and with our other partners, so that's where all of that will inform um, what could make up our next next phase. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think you both asked kind of the same questions that that I had. So mine are easy. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, for the, um, when you mentioned the UV, um, is it replacing the chlorine completely or is it just diminishing the need for it? Um, it would be, it will be the primary disinfection. We will retain, um, one of the kind of, uh, chlorine disinfection bays to serve as a backup, but it will, that will just be as a backup. We won't have to store as much chlorine gas, um, on site and the challenges that that, uh, has. Thank you. And then um, um, when you were talking about um, limiting inf um, the infill and infiltration, like I, I understand, um, uh, or the, the infiltration and then the inflow. I, I get how you limit the infiltration. We just need to make our pipes better. But what, how do you limit inflow? 
Um, a lot is looking for um, illicit or unknown connections that go directly into the um, sewer collection system. I mean, a lot of our city, a lot of our city, most cities have a lot of old infrastructure, and not um, all of what is underground is known or makes sense once our staff are are under there. Um, and so, while we have a robust GIS program um, and excellent uh, field utility field staff that are also super techy and really map what we have. Um, there's a lot still that when we pothole, we don't know that was there or how that how that worked. So that's um, kind of one one aspect of those um, in inflow kind of connections. And I don't know if nature would add any more. Um, does Council Member Stillman have any questions? She does. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, Emily, I wanted to ask you on your photograph that you showed one of the two oxidation ponds, and I can I can actually put a picture up too of myself instead of just my. Anyway, so I'm curious about in the oxidation pond, one of them. It looks like you're putting in baffles, and is that is that what's happening? It's the one that would be north. The, the furthest north one and is that because i know you've been dealing with somewhere your uh blue frogs and were any of those used in the oxidation areas yes so um I, there has been um a kind of i'm not going to use the word phase because we've been saying phase so much there have been um smaller projects um at the wastewater treatment plant that have been implemented to um you know uh, try to improve water quality standards consistently and some of those have been these um different blue frog uh, machines that also kind of work in a um a similar or a different way to provide that aeration um and also, um, there was we have installed eight aerators already, as well as a baffle wall in one of our oxidation um, ponds, and so that is helping with um, circulation of um, the well, water and in flowing through um, the oxidation pond, so that um, can have more kind of surface um, opportunities for that um, to be treated, um, and then the aerators are providing um, more of that aeration. Um, what is shown in this um, slide is really focusing on having um, 24 aerators installed with the opportunity for um, more to be added in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I can remember, well, I know that when you reason you're doing these homes that are selling, it's really important because a lot of them used to hook up all their gutters that went right into the wastewater system. And there was a time where you would think that Arcata was on fire because all the houses had smoke coming out of their gutter system, out of their pipes. And so I think it's really important what you're doing to continue. And the other thing is the infiltration that we've had. And I think you've made big dents in that over the years in order to stem that because we'd have, well, I don't know, remember what the, you call it, but a, when you would have a, a, a large storm and you could, the inundation from the, um, some of the areas, especially in the Sunnybury area was amazing and how that caused what, almost 60,000 whatever um, cubic feet that were going into the system. And that's one of the reasons it was so difficult to handle it. So I think, gradually all these things have been taken care of and we've seen more and more way to maintain the actual sewage that we have and that we aren't dealing with um, infiltration the same way we were in the past. I'm assuming that's still true because you just mentioned how you were doing that. So I think it's all excellent. I think you're moving forward and, and I'm glad to see we still have uh, the whole um, program that we that uh, Arcata came became known for originally uh, the whole wastewater treatment system with the various marshes and the and the, you know all the uh well the clop and then Gearhart and allen and uh, the all the marshes because i think that's one of our unique things and that it's still possible to utilize it so thank you Um, 
Yeah, so I'm just uh, wondering, so like, you know, I guess it's not really hypothetical, hypothetical because it's probably going to happen. Um, as HSU uh, works to create more housing for students, you know, how does that work with uh, how we, how we, um, how they connect to our system? You know, how is, is there negotiation there? And let's you know, say they build like an eight story building and, you know, thou, you know, a thousand students or something. Um, do, are we mandated? To, do we just have to hook them up? Is there any negotiation? How does that work? Um, they do pay the full hookup fees um, associated with that. Um, I'd have to review the state law to, I assume we are at that point mandated. Um, there's no other option for their wastewater. <laughs> so, but yeah, they do pay their full freight and, and they do pay their, uh, you know, not only for hookup fees, but for water and sewer going forward. But I, I would add, and I would add this kind of as a question and, and maybe a statement, but unless, you know, I mean, we, we get to a capacity that they, we can't accommodate them. So what happens then? HSU builds a, a building and we say, no, sorry, we can't hook up sewage for a thousand more people. Uh, we're at capacity. You know, what, what happens in a situation like that? Again, another hypothetical, but. Right. We're, we're going to keep our planning going so we're not that community. That is the goal. Um, but it is um, driven through our State Water Resources Control Board permit, and they do look at those dry weather capacity and those dry weather flows every single year. Uh, we pour it on you know, all of our parameters that were shared with you this evening every year. So that is something that we're monitoring continuously. And there are thresholds that kick in that the State Board says, now you really need to start your planning. What you heard tonight is that we're already starting the planning because we see where growth could potentially be going in this whole region and where the limitations of all of our you know, water and wastewater systems are. But the, the State Water Board will continue to monitor that in hopes of not, because ultimately they would be the ones giving us a cease and desist on hookups. So I would just interrupt that and say that I, I feel like one of the biggest things that Arcata's had to deal with for years is infiltration. And that we've been doing that, Arcata's been on that on a regular basis for many, many years. And if we can deal with infiltration, then that gives us a lot more capacity. Okay, let's go ahead and um, turn it over for public input. Just a couple things before we get going. So um, if you're here in person, we're going to take those in-person comments first. So please line up. Then we'll go to the um, online. And, and once we complete in person, we're complete, and then we're going to go to online, and then we'll complete that. So again, we're not going back and forth. Um, just another thing, I'm sure maybe questions might come up. Oftentimes questions come up in public input, but to reiterate, um, uh, staff, um, staff, neither staff nor council will respond directly to those questions. However, at the end of all of the comments, sometimes, um, oftentimes, great points or questions are raised by the public, and so a council member will will um, take it upon themselves to ask that question directly to staff. So I just want to be clear because sometimes it, it, it feels awkward when a question is asked and left hanging out there. That's just the process. So let's go ahead and start with in-person. Or staff will get back to you offline too, like they often do also. Uh, hello, Chris Richards here. Uh, uh, glad to see you all again. Uh, just a couple of questions. I've got somebody drew arrows all over here, so I'll see if I can follow this. Um, so the, the, the one question that comes up is, uh, I've seen this uh, same presentation in a slightly different, uh, a different way it evolves. The process is moving forward and we're trying to figure this all out. So yeah, this whole thing with the 20% number, it, it came up earlier and Nitra uh, claimed that as a safety factor. Like we have a buffer for when we reach to a certain point, we wanna have X amount beyond what our current capacity use is. And yet tonight you were calling it a growth factor. So I, is, is that just something you interchange? Um, and then we've got this whole thing about phase one going through, and that's great, that's wonderful. Or finally, you said seven years or 10 years or longer, whatever it was. And phase two was uh, originally designed to match phase one, but what what's happened apparently is the state board is really wanting to see how well it works. 
And you know, previously I asked you about this 30 month factor of uh, the production of doing phase one and wondering uh, with the number, and tonight you even said this feasibility study could start this fall. So I mean, that, that keeps moving and I'm wondering how firm that's gonna be. It sounds to me from what I read with the state board information is they really wanna have this project phase one finished before they really can understand how well it's working and, and all of that. Plus we'll see what the population has done between now and then. So we're looking at two and a half years before the feasibility study is gonna be real accurate. And then it's back to that same thing with, let's see, we've got the Cal Poly numbers that are hopeful that didn't kick in much this year, but that might change next year. And then we, we're also looking at meetings that maybe Karen knows more about. Are they gonna be willing to step up for phase three when we get to there? Cause we, you know, if we get there sooner than we hope for, it would sure be nice to have them as partners rather than the public uh, paying or borrowing some bonds that are gonna be really stretched out pretty far. So I, I think people should be reaching out to Cal Poly and saying, hey, let's get your numbers up with students. That's great, it's gonna help the community, but you guys need to step up to bat. And I know that's been mentioned, the Planning Commission, uh, Judith Meyer has brought that up uh, numerous times. And I mean, I think it's something we need to all get together on and really, you know, connect with those folks and get some firm answers. Um, I think I'm out of time and I may have said most of what I wanted to say. But anyway, I appreciate the input. I'm glad to see the planning moving forward. Thank you all so much. Thank you. The first point I'd like to make is this past weekend on Saturday and Sunday in the New York Times on the front page, um, big section on California, something that nobody's really thinking about that they're predicting massive storms in the future. And we're talking about storms off of Hawaii that are 1,500 miles long by three, 400 miles wide. And we're talking about the, the volume of water when it slams into California between like 15 to 30 inches per storm one storm after another. Um, this is some leading scientists that, have, that are in this, this article that are predicting this. And we're talking about the, the amount of water is about 25 times in the Mississippi dumping into the ocean there in the Gulf. So um, I, I'm sure that this isn't being part of this tonight because this is such a new material, but that's another factor. Um, I'd also bring back to this treatment phase number one is basically water quality. It seems like it's probably a state mandate to make your discharges cleaner than they there were in the past. But looking to the future, what still hasn't been addressed is where is this, um, I mean, we're all in agreement at some point in the future, not exactly the date, but it will go under the, the plant. So where is that location gonna be? If planning would be, identifying that by having somebody do the study and then the city securing that land and not developing that land so that in the future we don't uh, wipe out Arcata with the fact that the plant goes under and there's no way to dis treat our sewer and it gets discharged in the bay. So we really need to be addressing that um, because the other alternatives are basically building the levy system, which is a lot of, we're talking millions of dollars that are, that are probably going to the state for that. And there's progressive communities like in Portland and in Europe, the Dutch are basically going more of the retreat approach, which um, part of foundation of Arcata is bringing up how important our wetland areas were. And in the 1890s, how they were, those settlers came in and basically destroyed a lot of those wet, wetland areas that had effect on all of California's native population. So, and I would make the argument that we're sort of, you know, building on that, on the settlers, um, you know, levy system, and we're not looking at alternatives that are less expensive and the retreat. And this is also part of uh, Joe Biden's um, executive order for innovative ideas. Um, and also it's a California initiative. It's called the 3030 initiative worldwide and I guess I'll send you some more information on that but it's another way of looking at our area and doing it in a very smart way that's more environmental friendly instead of just going the old system of let's build levees and we can see the last hundred years where that's got us with thank you 
Good evening in person this time. Um, nice to see you all. I try to stay away from indoor public settings. <laughs> Has something to do with my age. In any event, I wanted to raise a couple of questions. I understand you're going to be doing a feasibility study uh, with respect to the increased population. That's correct, right? OK. Um, and it'd be interesting to understand what your population projections are likely to be with respect to that. Um, we'd been planning for 4,000. Now what are we going to be talking about? Um, it would be nice to know. Um, you indicated there's going to be a parallel mechanical system within the core area, or that's part of the plan or the option. Is that the case? It's not currently being done. It's part of phase two or three. OK, anyway. Um, <laughs> so how much additional capacity can we put in the core area? And at what stage are we going to need to reach out and find another place to do this? And how much of the plant would we have to move? So I think that would be useful to look longer than we're looking when we do with this feasibility study. I also think we need to be looking at the um, plan construction. What kind of standards do we want for our plan construction that we're talking about doing in terms of saving water, in terms of uh, limiting affluent, low flow toilets, et cetera? I don't know if that's all going to be part of our building standards. Um, but I think we should take that into account as ways to limit the affluent that's going into the system. Um, there are dry, what do they call them, dry toilets. You know, There are all kinds of ways to limit the affluent. Um, and I think all that needs to be examined as part of a feasibility study and as part of what kind of standards we want to have for our new construction. Um, let's see. Where would we move if we needed to move? Uh, assuming we start having these great big storms. Um, and is there, do we have, you, you mentioned that we can divert it into our ponds as a holding space. How much can we divert if we have one of these huge storms? So I'm just raising some of those questions. I don't know the answers to any of them. <laughs> so I'm just raising them at this time. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, it would be nice to have one that looks, when we have the feasibility study, that looks, OK, what are we planning for? Worst case scenario, if we get all this more population quickly and if we have these big storms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello again, Dan Close. I'm wearing the, to protect the microphone and out of public concern. The low flow toilet, um, I actually go in search of a lot of things. I moved here in large part because of the environmental reputation of this area. And I've been here for 35 years, um, longer than a lot of people that claim to be locals have been alive. So um, my first visit was in 1980 when my best friend was residence hall director. And um, we went to the marsh because some women from Eureka told us that was the dump and that, that was a good place to hang out after going to a, what was Humbrews, before it was Humbrews, Toppers, whatever. Anyway bowling alley before, obviously. But um, change happens, development happens, but it, there are smarter ways to do things. One of the problems is that you assume people are intelligent. If you've looked at what people will flush down a toilet or what people will throw in a trash can or a recycling bin, that's a big problem. People are not intelligent. They're not educated and they're not participating. And you gotta kinda dumb it down. Now, um, I go searching for places that have waterless urinals. Because as a man, you know, 
who needs any water to get rid of urine? Especially when you don't have to sit down. They should invent a female waterless urinal. And we should stop thinking dilution is a solution to pollution. Just because we have all this water is no reason to use it that way. Now let's go to the water quality, what's coming in. Um, I'm told that we have to add chlorine to our drinking water because of state law. And the water coming in from the rainy wells is plenty clean enough to get by without the chlorine. We probably add fluoride for people's teeth. That should be a choice. And as far as the infrastructure with Sunnybrae, I watched, I was living there when they relined the pipes. Instead of digging up the roads, they sent cameras down all the pipes and they relined them. It was super fast, it was efficient, and obviously it's happening everywhere. But there were big companies, but it's really expensive. And the problem is it all gets passed on to poor people. While everyone gets rich off of the development and the money, the people that live here are being forced out by the prices of sewer garbage, and they're paying for people's ignorance and stupidity, and it's gotta end. And the rich people are making money on it. Thank you. Water is life. We're talking about sewage, and we're talking about drinking water, and we're talking about flushing toilets and the increased number of toilets that are going to be flushed in Arcata with drinking water, potable water, unless we really decide to do things differently. I was attending a city council meeting many years ago and have a vivid memory of Jen Colt of Humboldt Baykeeper bringing in a professor, um, gentleman, I don't know who it was, and they were all talking about retreat and the great need for retreat. Around the same time, I was able to um, learn through a course or a, a presentation by Alderon Laird about sea level rise. He had just done his kayak trip around the bay and such. And, <clears throat> and uh, I just think business as usual is what has been talked about tonight. And it, you know, the world is not going to be as usual. And we need to really be revolutionary again in how we behave toward the future about what we're talking about in terms of treating human um, toilet flushings and um, dealing with our drinking water. We are in a very um, unique situation in California. I came from Santa Barbara where drought is, um, and water conservation is just, you know, part of the daily ritual now. And um, we need to do a lot more. I went to a Coastal Commission meeting. They talked about the Indianola bypass. Then they got the report after they approved that, they got the report from Alderon about sea level rise in the bay. And then it was like, what are we going to do with the 101 corridor? The gentleman talked about mega floods. You know, we're talking about things that band aids are not going to fix, and fingers in the dikes are not going to fix, and honoring the wetlands and not doing ongoing settler type of design with levy. Um, levies and improvements and things like that. I mean, we really got to be revolutionary in what we're thinking about. And I'm sorry, it's just like business as usual ain't going to cut it. So let's get our act together and start about retreat for one thing. You know, where are we going to build an alternative place for those flushing toilets? And the Barrel District was one of the places that had been um, pointed out as a potential retreat spot for the existing marsh. We have a wonderful marsh, and let us keep it for people to recreate in. But at some point, probably in a sooner future than not, it's going to get flooded, and we're not going to be able to use it for sewage. So, revolution. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and go to online comments. Our first comment is call in user five. Go ahead, call in user. Go ahead, call in user. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. 
All right. We'll go to the next one. We'll come back, Colin User. All right. Next speaker is Greg. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? We can. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, you know, appreciate the staff report. You know, it's very complex and very expensive, uh, this sewage treatment plant. Um, I didn't really feel like there was a really quality answer to uh, Sarah Schaefer's question about um, capacity and growth. And uh, I think we have to acknowledge, and, and I appreciate also what Joanne said, you know, about business as usual, but um, that the not only is, is the uh, e ecology changing, uh, that's going to force changes to where the sewage treatment plant is or how it's going to work. But the demographics here are going to be changing rapidly. And we're going to get climate refugees, the college is expanding. <clears throat> and I, I really don't hear that we are taking this seriously in Arcata. I hear that, oh, the Coastal, uh, Coastal Commission uh, and Water Quality Board will be regulating us. Um, but it really is uh, very common to fall back on these standard and maybe at one time usable mechanisms for change, but we are in a different situation now. And I, I want my, our city council to recognize that and to um, seriously devise uh, significant measures uh, to address these major changes in demographics and in uh, sea level rise. Um, you know, there, we have to, the sewage treatment plant, first of all, is revolutionary and it is already revolutionary, um, which I would say to Joanne, and wonderful. And we're so lucky to have it. Um, and uh, it's, but it's not going to hold up uh, to what is coming. And in, when I was in Sonoma County, which is where I'm from, I saw the growth down there. I worked as a re reporter for a few years in the mid 80s, and then I went back and did it for a few more years in the early 90s. And I covered Santa Rosa and the politics and expansion there, which we have saw explode. And they, the city um, offered its residents and the rest of the county, which is affected by its growth, very similar uh, guarantees in terms of sewage capacity. And then they were in such a bind that there were these emergency dumps into the Russian River. And they wanted to build a reservoir in the last um, only real native forest around the Petaluma area and dump it all there. And it, it was amazing. And they were spending millions and millions of dollars in fines and in these measures. So I think we really do need to think differently, think outside this box that we've always been in. And the future is here. And I want, that's what I want to hear addressed from my city. And uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, call in user five. It looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead. Oh, no, you muted yourself again. Okay. You had it. You had it. Unmute yourself, call in user. Hello? Yep. Okay, we can hear you. Hello? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa, so I work here, and I'm an Arcata resident. And uh, I'm not nearly as eloquent as previous speakers um, like Greg King, whom I greatly admire, and uh, Joanne, and the gentleman who first talked about the mega plug. Um, but I um, I just actually have been started educating myself about this issue recently. And I came across an article by Michael Machi, which appeared in the Mad River Union in March. And uh, I urge you all to read it. First of all, I, I sent that to you. And he explains that the Antarctica Swedish ice shelf, known as the Doomsday Glacier, is showing serious signs of breaking up and could melt in as little as five years, causing as much as 10 feet of sea level rise. Also, the land in Humboldt Bay is subsiding at the fastest rate of any place else in California. And then finally, I also read in the Bay Guardian reports that due to climate change, we can expect more frequent mega floods and more severe. So I'm wondering, like other people, if you're, if you, you're prepared for the worst case scenario and, uh, you know, <laughs> like we'll be underwater in five years. And uh, a lot of the infrastructure south of, uh, of uh, Samoa and west of Old Arcata Road. So do you have a plan where to relocate the uh, sewage treatment plant in critical infrastructure and businesses? 
And if you don't have a plan for that, then I think you're not looking out for the health and safety, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, our CADA residents deserve better than that. And I strongly urge you to put together an advisory board made up of professionals, engineers, climate experts, wetlands and sewage treatment experts, um, who can advise you about just how much density our aging infrastructure can withstand. And I'm not sure you can build on a mud surface, build an eight-story building on wetlands and uh, guarantee that, that those buildings are going to stand for, you know, decades to come. Anyway, I really appreciate your time and um, urge you to get an advisory board together and protect the health and safety of all our Cater residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no more online public comment. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments from council? Comment. Um, yeah, I feel like what we've heard here tonight is that the cities and Cal Poly's Humboldt, Cal Poly Humboldt's, uh, you know, potential development plans are far outpacing our work to provide the necessary infrastructure. And I wholeheartedly believe that the staff is doing absolutely everything possible that they can, um, moving stuff as you know forward as fast as they can. Um, and it sounds like we do have plans to find solutions, but just the reality of it is that you know these things are going to take several years to um you know maybe even just do studies before we can move forward with more planning um so uh yeah i mean if you know we're, the staff is doing everything possible um but it's just the reality of it is that that planning um and that work isn't able to kind of keep pace with uh development plans then it seems like the only option is to maybe try to slow down some of those development plans a little bit um, so we could catch up with our infrastructure. Um, so, you know, and I think it'd be really important to have this conversation with uh, Cal Poly Humboldt, you know? I mean, what if, you know, they can build stuff, they've got a lot more money, you know, over $400 million, right? So they can throw up buildings and, um, you know, maybe they just, for example, they build stuff faster that we can approve the gateway plan and get and attract developers. Um, you know, it's, there's a, a feasible scenario where um, they take up our capacity uh, with the wastewater treatment plant. So, I mean, it seems like it would make sense to have that kind of conversation with them. You know, I think in a reasonable world, um, we could come to agreement with them, um, you know, about some of their plans and how it's going to affect our wastewater treatment plant. And, um, yeah, other than that, I think it was a great presentation, and I, you know, really appreciate everybody that's been paying attention and is involved in it. So just to wrap it up, I, I want to do something a little bit differently because there were a lot of questions and concerns raised. So just if staff, if there's anything that you feel led to respond to, um, I just wanted to give you that opportunity. Absolutely, you don't have to, but if there's things that you'd like to respond to or address, um, you know, I'd like to give you that chance. Sure, thank you. Um, I think there was a lot in this presentation. I appreciate um, also of um, people that were also at the Planning Commission on June 14th had a similar presentation with you know some updated information and timelines um, tonight. Um, I did want to just clarify about the 20% growth factor and that was a term that was used in the facilities plan and um, from 2017 and also in the CEQA document um, for the phase one project. Um, and so as nature, as our city engineer, you know, really pointed out that is, that was considered a, a factor of engineering safety. Um, the CEQA document also really refers to um, the, you know, in, intention or the, um, the planning for 1% of growth per year as the phase one project was um, designed and intended to serve the current population and replace aging infrastructure. So there are interchangeable terms, but I wanted to use what was in that um, facilities plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, um, we have another um, probably lengthy topic next. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll come back at 8.15. So thank you.
All right, welcome back to the Arcata City Council meeting. Um, we are now moving into new business. Um, item A is to review and consider the um, information presented from Responsible Growth Arcata. And because this is a gateway area plan item, I will be recusing myself and turning the um, leadership of the meeting over to the Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. We will wait for you to leave. No. <laughs> Okay, um, so yes, we're on to new business. We have Scott McBain here to present this request, and Jane, I believe, as well. Um, so if you guys want to come up and, and get on started, we are ready to hear what you have for us. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm, again, Scott McBain, and um, I, my co-presenter is uh, Jane Woodward. She was um, a member of the Plaza Improvement Task Force, so um, she has more direct experience with task force processes than I do firsthand. Um, but I just, again, want to kind of first reaffirm that our intent here is to help the city produce a balanced, high-quality gateway plan that we're proud of today in the next 20 years. Um, we're not anti-gateway, we're pro-gateway. So I um, just want to say that again, because um, there's some confusion about that sometimes. Um, so this advisory committee request that we're prov providing to you mirrors the proud tradition of previous City of Arcata task forces that have been su used successfully to improve large-scale infrastructure and planning um, efforts in Arcata, and it also builds broader community support towards a better outcome, which is kind of why we're here. And you know, these started in the 70s with the wastewater treatment plant in 1977 and 79, and with the general plan update 2020 and more recent, most recently in the Plaza Improvement Task Force. So um, this isn't an unusual thing. Um, and the advisory committee is, in, I guess, is kind of like the same thing as a task force. So there's some issues on which terms we use. But the objective for us tonight is just to allow you to consider this um, proposed strategy and discuss the value and benefit of an advisory committee if you choose to establish one. And this is similar to what we presented at the um, Planning Commission last week, but we made some revisions based on that discussion. Um, so next, Karen. So again, um, you know, our letter that you have in your packet on page 81, um, we, there's a lot of signatories that support this, and a lot of these um, signatories, um, you know, 86 and counting, um, support this uh, largely because this has been a successful process that we've used in the past. Um, and it, it con consists of a wide range of Arcata community members, um, previous task force members, city government representatives, um, professors, local community service district folks, um, engineers, scientists, planners, developers, business owners, renters. So it's really diverse. Um, and I was really pleased just to see everybody came out of the woodwork that, that wanted to see this happen, particularly folks that have participated in this before. Next. So kind of the brief overview of the organization. Um, wanted us to talk about some of the problems that we're trying to solve with an advisory committee, the objectives of the advisory committee, the strategy of the committee to address these problems, framework of the committee, or potential framework of the committee, and benefits, um, anticipated benefits of the advisory committee. Next. So um, some of the problems, and this isn't necessarily all of them that we're trying to solve, but just as a framework, we're starting in the upper left-hand corner of the content of the plan. There's you know, a lot of community concerns you've heard about, about um, uh, divisi or, um, divergent input is the term that's been used by um, city staff. We call it priority issues, just to, you know, they're just issues that we need to try to address. And these things include things like uh, participatory community engagement, um, limited data, quantitative data on community input and desires in the gateway area. Um, feasibility issues that we heard about earlier today, kind of the vision of what we want here, and so, some of the proposed actions in the draft plan, as we all know. So that's kind of the content. City time and resources, um, we're very cognizant of um, city staff's time and resources that, you know, we don't want to waste time. They have a large workload. And staff and committees um, are, um, have challenges to do both the gateway plan and um, the general plan update at the same time. There's also challenges with grant funding, as we've talked about, potential loss of funding, depending on timelines, and potential additional funding needs. So I just want to be um, aware of those. Completion timeline, um, we want to get this done as fast as we can, but we also need the time to do the plan right and have a good quality plan, including better community um, input, um, support, and trust. 
And then another one is just a recusal uncertainty. Since there's only four of you there now, there's uh, many uncertainties about um, potential city council and committee members that may have to recuse themselves from discussions of the general plan 2045 process if it's combined with the gateway plan, which would be kind of a shame under one EIR project. Next. So the objectives, next. Um, this is kind of one of the key things that we've been hoping for is to implement a more balanced um, community engagement strategy. Um, for months, this has been kind of an ongoing concern. And um, at the bottom, for me, I was just like trying to struggle with what was, um, what was kind of um, an, an issue here. And the chart on the bottom is from the Office of Planning and Research, Chapter 3, that kind of crystallized it for me, like the different levels of public impact on a decision ranging from simple on the left-hand side of just in, in for, providing information to the public all the way to the other end of the spectrum as the decision makers is in the hands of the public. And um, so the COVID pandemic has limited you know, early engagement efforts that staff has done. Um, next. Um, Can I just stop you really quick? Yeah. Just your comment earlier about four of us. Um, there's just three of us attending this, this item, right? Um, I believe Alex is still online. Okay. So yeah, I was just curious about that. Um, I know her property's 150 feet away from the boundary. Um, so it seems like based off of FPPC guidance in the past that it would be expected that she recused herself. And I'm just curious what the logic is right now of uh, her attending. I don't know if council member Stillman, you want to speak to that or not. It's up to you. Um, I don't see any uh, problems with talking about this. I mean, it's the same as um, you're able to attend all these meetings and you have a harassment issue with the city of council and the city of Arcata. And at this point, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm finding out whether I will have a conflict or not. But until then, I'm part of the group. As you are, Brett. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's it's uh, not within the FEPC guidelines that are pretty clear. So just express that. I know that. what you think, and I've read about what you've written online. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, so, so um, reboot. Um, so where we've kind of felt with the current process is that we've been in the consult phase where um, you know, again, part of this is COVID, but um, we've been able to provide public feedback, but there's no cause and effect. It's not a two-way discussion about how to solve some of these problems. Um, and I think what we'd really like to get to on this um, uh, um, spectrum is in the collaborate phase where we partner with the public in identifying solutions um, to these problems. And this is where we're so fortunate in the city of Arcadia, we've got some really smart people, creative people here that can help solve these problems. Um, it's not getting over to the far right side where they're making decisions, that's your, your job, but there's just a lot of help that the community can provide here. Um, next. So with a um, maybe a bit more engaged, uh, more better engagement strategy, this will also help um, build community trust um, within um, the products um, and build support for the gateway plan. That's really where we want to be next. One of the other things too, um, the uh, city staff have identified these divergent in input issues. We call them again, priority issues to address. And um, you know, we need to kind of address these things in a, in a way that we can build trust. And we've been working with um, kind of on our own list of initial or of priority issues based on input we've received from the community. And we'd like to provide that kind of information to you um, leading into the joint study session. Um, but the main point that we're recommending the advisory committee can focus on these priority issues and build from what's being done to date, um, not start from scratch. So it's kind of a focused approach. So we're not like starting all over and, re and rebooting the thing. It's really just focusing on these priority issues. Next. And recommendations um, for completing a final gateway plan on an expedited but achievable timeline. Um, so we want it implemented quickly, but with quality, uh, feasibility, innovation, and balance to provide a healthy community for housing, businesses, employment, transportation, and livability. So these are really important to, to the community, I think. Next. 
So kind of two big main strategies that we're suggesting here. Um, the first is to separate the gateway plan from the general plan 2045 process. And this kind of gets at this issue of um, recusal issues. Um, if these two things are combined, um, we're just worried that we're not gonna have full um, city council participation in the general plan up update. So separating these things out, this issue hasn't been resolved for a while as we can, as we just saw. So it'd be really desirable to have, you know, full city council representation on general plan 2045 update and this could help do that. Um, by doing this, it also provides um, time with elections coming up. If there's new elected city council members, they can be sworn in, get up to speed, and fully participate in the process. And overall, this gives the city more time um, to focus on the general plan 2045. The gateway plan has kind of sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room, and we haven't really talked much about the general plan update. So that's one big piece. Um, so the second big piece is um, in parallel to have the Gateway Plan Advisory Committee or a task force focus on the Gateway Plan um, to assist staff in, in trying to um, implement some of the objectives I talked about earlier. So focus on addressing and recommending solutions to those priority issues. Again, not start from scratch. Um, these, and then um, that the advisory committee would um, provide recommendations on how to finalize the gateway plan, but not actually working on the gateway plan. And these recommendations would go to, um, would recommend to the city council at a medium, at a minimum. So they're not actually working on the gateway plan itself. So this approach, um, you know, was used for this by the city general plan 2020, um, and again, advisory committees are have been suggested by the Office of Planning and Research um, as a strategy and tool for these. So this isn't an unusual um, sort of thing. It's pretty normal how uh, other communities are doing this. Next, next. So just kind of a framework on how this could happen. This is or how this could be um, kind of a process flowchart. And the uh, purpose here is to maximize benefits um, to the gateway plan and minimize impacts to schedule cost and time and particularly with city staff. So the city council would um, appoint um, the gateway plan advisory committee and um, dictate what the, the, their scope of work is and recommendations would go to the city council um, as the decision making body. We're proposing a small number for the advisory committee, seven to nine members, um, potentially including um, at least one planning commissioner, um, so that they can have a small number, be nimble and get work done, not like have 53 uh, members that takes two months just to schedule a meeting. Um, those members should be people that are um, willing to volunteer their time for the good of the future city of Arcata. And we, the, the role of this committee we envision is to provide, um, to lead and manage the process with assistance from city staff, and, but hopefully minimizing staff time demands, um, although there will need to be some, particularly for um, liaison and facilitation, um, hopefully with a, a contracted city facilitator. Next. So one of the key things of this um, that I think that will help improve, increase the productivity um, is creating topic working groups or breakout groups that are um, focused on these priority issues. And these would be identified by the advisory committee based on those priority issues that I mentioned before. And their task would be to address and recommend solutions um, to those priority issues. So ideally small groups of topical experts, four to six people um, that could really dig into an issue, brainstorm potential solutions, um, and address those issues in a more transparent way um, for public consumption, ideally, as well. And we could also bring in outside experts via Zoom as needed for assistance on specific issues that we don't have the expertise in-house to, to address. But again, build from what's been, been done, focusing on priority issues, not starting over. Next. And that this advisory committee would um, closely interact with the existing city staff, planning commission, and committees as needed, and, and, and consultants during normal meetings. Um, and so we're just trying to find a good balance for good information exchange, um, but not undue burden on staff and consultants. So cons consultations of initial recommendations and feedback and coordination and guidance and return next. And that the normal processes would still continue um, communication between um, 
staff, planning commission, and recommendations still going to city council. This was a question that came up during the planning commission. Um, and then lastly is kind of the other important part is the community engagement process. Um, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, the ideal here is for collaborative community engagement um, in this process. So there's kind of like three core things that we are looking for here. One is to conduct a rapid survey, the community quantitative survey to obtain quantitative data on community desires in the gateway area vision and priority issues. There really hasn't been a quantitative survey that's been done that's statistical. Um, and so just you guys knowing what the community wants in a quantitative way, you don't have to agree to it, but just as long as you have that information should be really helpful in making decisions on this. Um, the second piece of this would just be through the topical experts participating in the topic working groups through a transparent reporting of outcomes. So they can do this work, write white papers, summaries um, that summarize what, they've, um, what, what the outcomes are and then two-way public engagement workshops um, by the advisory committees to share with the public what's been learned and have opportunity for dialogue. Next. So another question that came up was, so what's the, what are the products um, that you see the advisory committee doing? And fundamentally, it's a recommendations report to city council as decision makers. So there's, I could see three pieces of this. We could see three pieces. One is just a synthesis of community engagement. One would just be the new, a new quantitative survey that could be done very rapidly. Um, second would be um, taking advantage of the recent community engagement information that city staff has done and synthesizing that into um, the, the draft community engagement report, but pulling that information instead of it being 150 pages of raw data, but like pulling it together, having the raw data, but also synthesizing it down to key learning outcomes. The second part would be appendices to the main recommendations report that summarize the effects, the efforts of the topical working groups. So it could include meeting summaries, but the important part would be short mem memos summarizing the efforts and results and recommendations of those topic work groups that would be sent to the advisory committee. And what the advisory committee would do is they would synthesize that information with the community engagement, as well as input from planning commission staff, um, committees and public to summarize recommendations. So kind of a tiered report where you have recommendations report and then a synthesis appendix and um, appendices of what the topic working groups had done. So hopefully that kind of clarifies some ideas there. Next. So um, potential criteria for membership, you know, we haven't like thrown out names for um, who should be on this and focused on the criteria. So one of the things that obviously we want is objective, um, problem solvers here um, that have given the role of the advisory committee that has leadership and management skills, um, committed to completing a high quality gateway plan, strategic and time efficient to get things done so we can get this done quickly, results oriented, familiarity with the gateway plan so that there's uh, to reduce the get up to speed time and has time to meaningfully engage in this. And again, I, potentially a planning commissioner and that they're willing to volunteer for the um, future glory of Arcata. Next. Um, so this is just kind of a list of potential topics. It's not um, a recommendation on all the topical work groups. That would be the responsibility of the advisory committee to develop, but it's just kind of the range of topics that we think are important to consider by the advisory committee. So some of this stuff will be done in a qu more quantitative way in the EIR, but we feel that initial analyses of most of these should be done in the gateway plan to assess feasibility issues. Um, so we don't get too far down the path of a final gateway plan and then find out in the EIR that, oops, that's not gonna work because it costs too much or um, we, there's some other constraint we have to start over. So some of the examples are you know, um, making sure that we have WIAT and other underrepresented groups input engaged in this, fire district services that we've heard a lot about, physical feasibility for the city, sea level rise, and wastewater treatment that we talked about earlier this um, today. Next. So potential steps and timeline for this. Um, again, we're trying to do this fast, but it's gonna take more time to do. So the first step would be with um, city council, um, with staff, with assumed staff assistance would take lead on appointments and the scope of work ideally having a kickoff meeting of the advisory committee um, by October. One of the first tasks would be to compile and supplement community input to date, um, ideally in November. 
So again, closely working with staff to compile existing input and um, address some of the still under development items in the engagement report, and then collect supplemental information um, via uh, quantitative community survey to better understand what the community feels about these priority issues. So kind of focused survey that's um, scientific. Um, we've developed kind of a draft scope of work and budget for doing this by a consultant that's been used before to inform the city. Um, so again, kind of an objective survey that's done to inform you guys. Um, and then the real work would begin with the topic working groups um, addressing those priority issues um, between, say, November and April 23, so a four to six month process where they'd roll their sleeves up and get work done. And then, um, and then the advisory committee would synthesize that information and convene public engagement workshops, so there could be one or two of those, um, perhaps in May and get better community engagement and feedback on what the advisory committee has learned and what they may recommend. And then, um, then the advisory committee could then develop a draft recommendations report, presentation to city council and planning commission, get feedback, and based on that feedback and direction, prepare a final recommendations report to city council for consideration. And then based on city council direction, um, city staff and consultant team would begin work on the um, final gateway plan, um, not the advisory committee. Next. So a few benefits here, um, maybe being a little bit nostalgic again about how this has um, been successful in the past. Um, but some of the key ones, um, again, is that um, allows planning commission, city staff, and city council to concentrate on general plan 2045 while in parallel the advisory committee can work on the gateway plan. So again, trying to get more work done in a shorter amount of time to provide more capacity to do both. Um, it'll give planning commission, city council, quantitative information on what the community prefers. Um, so uh, including underrepresented groups. Um, so it'll help you make more transparent and informed decisions. And um, you're gonna have to make decisions that may go against what the survey says, if it's 51 to 49%. That's part of your job is to make those hard decisions, but at least you have the information um, and it's more transparent. And I think the community can be more comfortable if, you're, if you have that information at hand. So I think that'll be a big um, improvement. Again, improves trust, buy-in, and support from the community so we can transition from uh, making two-minute uh, speeches at all the committee meetings to actually helping solve these problems. Um, it just feels a lot more um, like we're actually doing something to help the process um, better. Next. Um, and we can address um, feasibility issues are better addressed. So if we can dive into these things a little bit more and do reporting to address some of these things that will help improve the implementability of the gateway plan. So we've actually thought through some of these, or um, worked through some of these things in a little bit more detail. And so the Arcata Wastewater Treatment Facility is a good example of how that could be done. We may not have all the answers to solve those, but at least we can develop um, and articulate to the public that we have a plan for a plan on how to address them. So it's not just like, well, we'll deal with this later, but we can actually show how we're going to deal with this later. And that'll give us a lot more trust that there is actually a plan on how to deal with this rather than sweep it under the carpet. Um, and as part of this, we can bring more innovative problem solvers um, to help um, from the community to make the gateway plan better and more implementable. So again, you've got some amazing resources in this town that a lot of people don't have. We should take advantage of that. And that's what we've done in the past. And that'll give more people, more hands to do some of the heavy lifting on these priority um, issues um, and community engagement. So this won't solve the city council and committee recusal issues for the gateway plan, um, but it should help solve them for the general plan 2045 so we can get more committee and city council participation on that. So we have uh, full participation. And then lastly, um, there's gonna be more of these plans coming in the targeted rezone areas. And so this is kind of our first one. And if we can get this one better, if we can learn from it and do a good job on this, this should save us a lot of time on these future projects um, in the targeted rezone areas. Next. And so I'm done here, but I just did also wanna give you a few next steps. We're working on addressing the great comments and questions that were provided by the Planning Commission, just that we have a written summary of that. Um, I just, we just haven't had time to finish that up. Um, so we'd like to get that done prior to the joint study session. We're also um, 
have a pretty good draft of a potential framework for implementation that just provides a lot more details on how this could be done. Um, and again, we'd like to kind of hear what you guys have to say today and maybe adjust that based on the discussion and provide um, that prior to the joint study session. So um, just thank you for your time and um, hopefully we can have a good discussion. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, do we want to take public comment first just to kind of hear what the rest of the public has to say and then have our discussion or do we want to open with some questions that we might have, um, you know, Scott? As uncomfortable as it might be, we really need to discuss. Uh, Alex, not recusing yourself. It's in I black think we and need white. To take public comment it's first. It's in black and white on the FPBC goal. website that it is illegal for her to be a part of this you meeting. You know, Brett, do you want me to get into your legal issues that you have? I haven't done that publicly, and I am doing my due diligence. Yeah, and she'll, I she'll you face that PPC. No, so the city I, gets sued. I don't want to discuss it. The city gets sued because none of these decisions will be relevant, they won't matter. <laughs> The I'd like to ask some questions, I think, me. before we open it up to public me. comment. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask some questions first, okay. and then we can yeah. open up to Let, public let's comment. Let's address our questions, and then Thank we you. can take and public comment, and then we can have a little bit of Maybe the public comment this. will bring up some more questions, but I think some questions are a good place to start, because I did um, watch the Planning Commission meeting, and I feel like um, some of the questions that they brought up are some of the same questions I have. And first of all, I want to thank you. That was um, very comprehensive and well thought out um, presentation. But the one thing that I keep coming back to is um, how is this, well, firstly, how is this not duplicative of the many committees that we already have that are providing fee. We have transportation, we have parks, and we have wetlands and historic buildings and ETC. And I understand because I did, you know, I, I heard you, Jane, and I know that um, sometimes it's, uh, it's really hard to coax some good feedback out of them. Um, I haven't actually heard any of their recommendations yet, and I'm really looking forward to that. But how do you see this is not duplicative of the efforts that are already happening? There's two, two main things. Um, one is that, um, and I think I mentioned this during the planning commission meeting, different committees have different rules on, on how you can provide input. And so like I've been participating more recently with the wetlands and creeks and they're very generous on time. So you can actually have a conversation, but others aren't. So like I think the one last night, we got 90 seconds to provide, you know, each person got 90 seconds. So. To me, that's, if you go back, I'm not asking you to, but when you go back to that chart, it's like you you get to say your 90 seconds or three minutes at best, and it's like, where does that go? It just goes into well, a black hole, or it, it, it just kind of feels like a futile effort. The example that I gave um, with the planning commission, like with the topical work groups, is you can bring in experts that aren't here, that. Um, that aren't doing the two minutes, and you can actually roll up your sleeves and address these problems. And you can recruit experts to help you work through those issues more than two minute sound bites. Um, and so I've done a lot of these from, in the work that I do. Um, and these, these are just like incredibly useful because you can sit around a table and you can brainstorm solutions, identify the problems, identify uncertainties that you need, that you need to address, and you can document that in a transparent way. Um, and it just, it makes everybody kind of comfortable with the outcome. Yeah, and that's something that I would suggest is maybe, you know, asking these committees to maybe lengthen the amount of time for public comment. When I was on the EDC, I remember several times um, when we wanted some more clarification th on things, we would bring in experts mm -hmm. that would make presentations to us, and I found that was really useful, and I would um, encourage um, the liaisons to these committees to you know, seek out ways to do that and incorporate that into the committees. Um, the, other, the other question that I have is, you know, we keep saying um, we want to reach these underrepresented people and get their feedback. Um, the, the question I have is that these are the same people that for the last, I don't know, year, year and a half, haven't been giving feedback even though because they're like me, you know, they're single moms at one point or they work two jobs or, you know, and they just, they didn't have time then. What makes you think that, um, all of a sudden these people are going to have time to be on this committee. 
Well, they don't necessarily need to be on the committee, but as far as like getting input from them, um, I think that the that committee members and, and community leaders that are in those neighborhoods or in those groups can help get those folks to participate. And that may be different than having a, you know, a publicly announced meeting at City Hall and say, well, come if you can. I'm not saying that's what staff have done, but there may be other ways. That, again, you can get the community to help pull the community back in. So that's where, you know, and that's not my forte, but there's, there, there's, I think there's some other creative solutions to do that. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Nick, I'm not a single mother anymore, so. <laughs> um, what I did appreciate, um, can you put up that last slide? I think when you were talking about um, having um, a potential framework for implementation, because from what I understand, you don't want to be on this committee, right? Well, not on the advisory committee. The I have a job. Yeah, right? So um, I think that it's really important that whomever, if such a committee was formed, would have these steps to take. The, the one thing, um, you know what, I'm going to let some other people ask questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, and this might be more of a question for, for Karen, um, just to kind of clarify, because the, the language is getting confusing. So, because th there's a difference between a task force and like a, like a, if we created like a city council subcommittee, or, or I guess that could be like a subcommittee could be like an advisory committee. So, I mean, what is the difference between that? And then within that, my, my thinking, here's a long question again, with, with a full explanation, but, you know, agreeing a little bit with council member Matthews here, just about the worry of finding quality members for this committee through an application process um, that is different than what we already have on the committees. Um, and coupled with that kind of a worry about attendance of those those groups and kind of keeping on the schedule and how can we, you know, kind of force a group that keeps on this schedule and then also cast a wide enough net. Because I think that if we just say, hey, we're gonna have an advisory committee, let's take some applications that we're not gonna target and get who we want on this group. But if we say, we want an expert on sea level rise, we want somebody who works in the fire department, we want somebody who's a, a developer, we want mm -hmm. somebody from the neighborhood, you know, and to be able to kind of more target that and you know, get, get that interest of people that actually are going to be valuable to this group, not just like, yeah, I'll be on a committee, that sounds fun, um, you know, people, and to really you know, choose the experts that we want in the room. Um, so I'll ask my first question before I, I, I grandstand, <laughs> no. um, but uh, yeah, like what would be the difference between an official task force, an advisory committee, a city council subcommittee, if that's the same thing? I mean, what does that look like? Um, it's a good question, and, and I'll, I'll try to give you as straight of an answer as I can. I mean, the, the straight answer would be we can create whatever the council um, wishes to have created. Standard in the city, um, advisory committees are longstanding and ongoing. Task force have a discrete um, task, a discrete timeline, a discrete problem to solve, goals to create, and a recommendation to make. So what I've heard described here tonight would fit within what typically the city would refer to as a task force. Um, a council and or a planning commission subcommittee um, could be a couple of things. Uh, it could be, um, in this case, it would just be two um, council members uh, with the Planning Commission. If they had a subcommittee, they could have three because they have seven members on the Planning Commission. Uh, and then if you wanted a subcommittee that then had additional members, you could create that, like you said. We want a member from the fire department. We want, you know, we really are looking for a tenant that currently lives in the gateway area. You know, if you're looking for some specialty, but again, you're looking for people that are gonna be committed to a discrete, short term, but pretty intensive process. Um, you could create that. We have never um, in the past considered stipending or paying people for participation in a committee, but if there was particular expertise that you wanted to come and say provide presentation or provide, you know, the meetings to me when I look at this type of body of work is not the real cost and burden on staff. It's the development of the recommendations and the data and you know the building of the information that, that the task force or advisory group needs to be able to make well-informed recommendations to the council. So you know we would just have to, I think, figure out what are sort of the key topic areas between the council and the planning commission that 
you definitely want additional information. And we could work on trying to create a system where we did identify some experts in those fields that the council may even wish to stipend or support their contributions to the group for that professional expertise. I mean, that's just off the top of my head tonight, so we certainly could discuss that further and certainly could discuss that with the, at the, the planning commission. Yeah, and I know that we are gonna agendize this for our study session, but um, I do think um, the idea of a subcommittee does sound very enticing to me, and um, the the one thing that I think that's not focused on in any of these committees that I would really be interested in diving into the real meat of is the whole idea behind these form-based codes. I think that's something that would be a really great thing to kind of hone in on because um, I, I think that's something that most people really do not have any idea you know, what they are, and I think having experts to talk about that, I like the idea of possibly, you know, getting stipends, I don't know, I mean, we'd have to talk about that more, but um, to get true committed experts, if, if that's something that needs to happen. Alex has a question as well when you're ready, Sarah. So, so last night, uh, the planning, I, I watched uh, about seven hours of planning commission meetings, you know, the last two that they had, and I watched them grapple with um, all the issues that are brought forward by Scott, and they seem to be making progress. Now, if they need to bring in some experts on certain areas, they have been doing it, and they could ask for more for whatever they might need, but um, the planning commission encouraged citizens to participate last night in the um, online form-based code that they had. It was from 6 to 8, but actually ended about 7.45, and where they were able to um, talk about them, and they had about 50-some people, and they were asking how you felt about all the different areas that they're proposing. You know, they have the barrel, they have the, I can't remember all the names, but, um, and then you could vote on them because they had a voting system for it. And it was overwhelmingly in support in all the areas for the height requirements. And I thought that was really interesting that it was. And I think um, the planning commission in many ways, would, would we be taking away from the planning commission and their job if we set up this, sub, this additional, I don't know what you, you know, you asked all the names, what it could be called from them. And what would that do to our timeline for our housing element? Because I know the housing element is something the state is extremely interested in. And they would like to have it, I think it's supposed to be done by the end of August. And if this committee came in with the, and they would have to get educated, they would use staff's time. And we talk about how limited our staff is and ability with time, no matter where, because we have a very thin staff. Um, I, I think we'd probably put another year on this project. And I think people are nervous because they don't know what form-based codes are. I remember the first time was probably in the 90s at a historic preservation conference where they talked about how form-based codes could really make a big difference in your historic neighborhoods, downtowns, et cetera, especially for those that had, well, I'll use like Central Avenue as an example, an extra wide street. And how would you bring that down to feel better for walking, bicycle, trees, et cetera? And I do know McKinnaville and their town center plan to use four base codes. And <clears throat> so I'm thinking that um, maybe the council needs to get better informed about that because it took me a while to very, you know, to get understand that. What is this? But I'm thinking now as time goes on that that would be a way for us to really manage our whole area of Arcata is to be able to have form-based codes. And then it, it, it takes away all the questions for the developer. But the one thing I'm concerned about is that people think if they drive to Eureka and they come back, there'll be an eight-story building there. And they don't, you know, we have to remember it takes a very long time for development. And if you don't get anything in place, then you're not going to be able to even start to find out who can do what or when or how many years it's going to take. So I, I think um, this is all getting us ready. It's putting us in place. And then we can, um, but it's not going to be overnight. It's going to be probably many years before we see some of these things come to fruition. But if we don't have a basis or a planning 
for anything in Arcata, then we're not going to be able to see um, things occur, good development occur, and uh, development that has the incentives. And, and I know, I think about it, how the Arcata Library is really wanting to relocate. And last night they talked about incentives and so, um, and benefits and development. And that's open space, it's parklands, it's, um, it would be the library. A library could be on the ground floor or top floor of a, a building, and that would be a tremendous benefit and amenity to a community. So um, I worry about um, stopping our project. I've spoken to Scott. I understand his concerns. I understand the um, wh where they're coming from, but I, I'm feeling like um, if we don't aren't giving the planning commission enough. Um, details or um for people to talk to them then that's where we should be we should actually beef up what the planning commission needs if they need to uh, deal with one whole session just on soils or i mean a lot of people wanting to have all the soils figured out before you do it you can't do that you know every soil is different and when you go to start building or thinking about it that's when you're going to start your process so i i think um you know we should continue giving our planning commission what we need. And what Scott sees we're lacking, those should be points. And we should say to the planning commission or planning department, please bring in so-and-so, please get so-and-so to do this and that and, and um, make it happen. And I do agree that we've had so many, um, um, since the discussion has started, so many meetings, so many people walking. We have a fear basis and we have a positive basis. And I've gotten letters of, for this committee sporting, supporting it and not supporting it. And um, I would say they're almost equal on what I've gotten in the mail. And I've gotten people worried that we're moving too fast. And change is one of the hardest things we can possibly have in our life is change. But that's a daily thing. Every day is change. And um, we, we get not used to accepting it. We like things stagnant. But if we're going to continue to be a community that people like, we're going to have to change. You know, I have one answer, which is this concern, and maybe this will help. So with Humboldt State or Cal Poly, um, they estimate a goal of 11,000 students. And Mark Andre always talked about when he went to Humboldt State, some of you may know who he is, some of you may not know, but he was a staff person for the city of Arcata and environmental services until he left and Emily took his job. We, he went to school with 8,700 students. That was what the it was. And this year they're gonna have 6,600 students and it's gonna take quite a while to ever get up to 11,000 and which is their goal. And they plan on building all together with Craftsman Mall and some of the units on, on campus about 4,000 units period. So I don't know if that'll help with your concerns and with the planning commission's concerns because they want to know what the university is doing, but maybe this will make a difference. Here Thanks, Alex. I just want to say that I actually did talk to some council members in Eureka today, and I know that Cal Poly is also in building houses in Eureka and McKinleyville, so it's not a burden that we are going to be bearing for ourselves. So. Um, okay, I would like to add some of my thoughts now and then we'll take public comment and then we can reevaluate our thoughts. Um, but yeah, what I really see, I think, as the role and what really could push a group like this to be productive and, and helpful in this process is to have a group that can work to formulate and address these ideas in the form-based code. Because really, the form-based code is not separate or different than the gateway plan. It is the gateway plan. Um, and that, you know, those are really the specific things where people can get down to the nitty gritty, work with experts, get their hands dirty and talk to, you know, their fellow community members to be able to decide things like, yeah, what kind of setbacks do we want to see? How tall are the buildings? Are there alleyways? Is there a park over here? Are there stairs? You know, all of these things that are so specific that are part of a form-based code that, um, you know, we don't necessarily as, as a council, as a commission, um, you know, have the time to almost get into every single one of those details because it really should be a process that can be 
you know, kind of community-led and, and easy to get feedback in that sense. Um, I, I kind of did some research and, and saw a couple just different communities that, you know, went the route of not having any sort of community advisory task force, um, you know, and ultimately these form-based codes get to a similar final product, but I guess it all depends on, you know, who's in the community and how they feel about that project also. Um, but I did, you know, if you're interested in looking into them, uh, Van Vancouver, Washington, Clark County, Washington um, had a pretty interesting process that involved a gateway, not gateway, uh, form-based code advisory committee that kind of participated in like a couple sets and, and really helped city staff be able to kind of suss out details and like week long, you know, we're going to be here for a week, come whatever day you want, like charrette processes and like really working, um, you know, to, to create that with most of these committees seem to have at least one planning commissioner on them. Um, I think it would be helpful. I mean, even maybe it's just because I like to be involved and be nosy, but to have, you know, some of us from council be on there as well, I think could be really beneficial just so you know, we are knowing what's happening and seeing what's going on. But I really think that, yeah, being able to develop this form-based code um, is kind of the meat of it and what really um, an advisory committee like this could, could help with. Um, so, yeah. And... I was just going to say, Sarah, I understand the form-based codes, but I think the advisory committee is interested in more than just that. Yeah, and, and that's why I think, you know, kind of receiving this feedback from us and, and from the Planning Commission and seeing kind of, I, I think this is going to be a topic of discussion at our study session, so I don't, you know, I, I don't consider that we're going to move forward on this tonight, but, you know, you guys are getting the necessary feedback you need from, from us to kind of, and, and staff is now hearing, you know, how we feel about it to kind of retune and fine-tune this to say, you know, I don't necessarily agree with all of the work products that you're putting up in this presentation, but I think there are value in a lot of them and some of them, and I think that we can pick some of these and, and move forward and really, you know, create something, you know, that is kind of that middle ground between let's just let staff do it and let consultants do it and bulldoze through and finish it versus let's, you know, create a committee and only let the committee do it, you know, and, and find that like common middle ground to be able to compromise on that and to, to bring, bring this forward in the creation of a really robust, high quality code that's going to, you know, like you said before, Alex, you know, create something, put it on the books. So when developers come in, we know what we're getting. The, we know that the community is behind it and we know that it's going to be supported. So I think that's, you know, really the most important part of creating any committee like this is to figure out what this form based code looks like because I know everybody is dying to see it so <laughs> and one of my favorite things to reference is uh, this organizational chart that we have in the city of Arcata that shows you know on the top it's the city council and then you have the city manager and all the staff and on the very top above everything it's the, the people in Arcata that elect us to be here and to represent them and um, you know, I'm never going to assume that just because I was elected and I'm sitting up here that I know better than what a bunch of educated, hardworking, involved community members, you know, have, have put together with 86 signatories of formal council members and local board members and humble Cal Poly professors. Um, I mean, to me, this is the community is telling us what they want and this is it. Um, you know, I, I received 10 to 15 emails supporting this and maybe one not supporting it. Um, so, you know, that's just my sense on it so far. Um, and it seems like the Planning Commission decided that they wanted us to make the decision. That was my understanding. Um, so, so, yeah, that's how I feel about it. Well, having watched the last Planning Commission meeting, they are hoping when we have our meeting with them um, that we will not, the whole meeting won't be taken up with the discussion about this subcommittee. They're hoping they'll be able to handle other items. I'm just bringing that up having watched that last meeting, which was a little over three hours. Yeah, I think we're in this like purgatory of, we, we want the planning commission to tell us and give us better recommendations and then they want us to just decide. So I think, you know, really to sit down and have this conversation of what do we want you to recommend to us? What do we, you know, assign work basically and be able to you know have a successful discussion around what i think we want to see because it's really you know it's a daunting task and it's a difficult task when we have a body of of seven people that are involved versus the three of us um when they are all also experts in their their area um to be able to have that discussion with them i think has value yeah 
Jane, Jane is eager, and I think we should just take public, um, but you, you have something as a presenter to add in. Okay. Jane is part of the presentation, so we will I add you in. I just wanted to make the comment that one of the possibilities is have it be a task force working with the Planning Commission to develop these particular topics. In other words, they, they, they have been kind of feeling left out, okay, which was expressed by Judith Mayer. Um, and I think if they were head of, in essence, the task force, um, and a part of it, um, and one of you could be on it too, or however you want to do it, you could be free to attend it, but the point is that they would then have this to manage, and they could work with you in identifying the members in the subject area areas. I mean, you're going to have to, sorry, <laughs> you're going to have to pick the topics you wish to be investigated. That's part of it. You, de you determine the scope. You determine who's on it based on the topics you want to be addressed. So first year I say, this is what I want to address with this group. And then secondly, these are the people who can address that. Let's go ask them. It's not that you just open it up to the community, come and see if you want to be on this. You pick who you want. Um, and that's how the Plaza Improvement Task Force was done. People were identified to be on it. They had to agree, of course. But everybody volunteered their time. And we spent a lot of time. And we went out and, you know, I went out and I surveyed the seniors. I went to community senior lunches. You know, I caught Valentine's Day and got 40 of them one day. You know, it was very handy. So if you select your targets well um, of how to get access, then you actually go administer the survey and get the information you need. You don't, you also alongside that can do a, a online survey to add, add additional things. But I'm just saying, you can design this however you want. The point is we want, and, and when we talk about the engagement, I just want to make one other point. We have done, an in, when he gave that chart of the engagement process, the first part is information out. We've done an enormous amount of information out. The frustration has been getting it back and then getting it summarized and having it be quantitative and not just a zillion comments. You know, we've gotten tons and tons of comments. But the issue is, what do people really think, and is it representative? Thank you. Great. Thank you for adding that in, Jane. Um, OK, so any, I think we should go to public comment now. Um, and so if you are here in person, please line up at the podium. We will take in-person public comment first, and then we will move to Zoom. You get three minutes. May okay. I begin? Yes, you may. So um, I was not one of the 86 signatories because I wasn't asked to sign it because I have not been allowed to participate in a lot of the social media discussions on Gateway or invited to meetings where um, this is being discussed. So I'm kind of a standalone lone wolf maverick, whatever. Um, but I'm speaking that how did we get to this point? How did we get to this point where we're now asking for a task force or an advisory committee? And a lot of it has to do with the process and the tail wagging the dog a little bit in reality during the pandemic and how I attended a meeting at the Arcata Playhouse prior to the COVID pandemic where uh, De La Freitas was there and a lot of us in the Creamery District were discussing housing in the Creamery District. And then the pandemic hit and nothing happened. And then all of a sudden a gateway project is presented to the community. And so I think a lot of us were just like, wait, what's this all about? So in people asking for um, participation now, I think it's because they didn't feel they got it in the very beginning and that it was a lot of uh, things happening with staff and consultants that put something together and then tossed it out to the, the citizens of Arcata. So um, I've been thinking a lot about timelines and priorities and uh, who would be on this task force and time spent even discussing it as we're doing tonight and at the community sessions and all. And, and perhaps there is a different way that we can do this without 
creating a whole other task force at this point in time, but a lesson learned about a task force like this should have been in existence before a gateway plan, area plan was presented to the public. And also, I'm very confused about the general plan and the gateway plan and how those two things merge, because it does seem to me that it's really important that city council um, in full be allowed to discuss the general plan. And if they can't do it because they can't discuss the gateway plan or some people can't discuss the gateway plan, what, what's, the, what's the reason for the conglomeration of those two things and why can't we separate them? But anyway, at this point, I would like to encourage us to find a way around just creating a whole other thing at this point in time um, in terms of a, a task force advisory committee or even a subcommittee. But something, you know, we really do need to get the community, the people, um, you know, input somehow um, quantitatively and anecdotally, whatever, um, put forth. So. Do your job, and I'll be looking forward to what your decision is. Thanks. Hello, uh, James Becker. Once again, uh, hello to staff and to the commission. Oh, sorry, to the council. Um, I was thinking about the commissioners because I was at that planning commission meeting and been at a lot of them, and I believe that they took a fair and balanced look at it, and I don't think it was quite as... Uh, uh, doomed as I think was presented. I think they do, uh, there are no decisions been made and there's people that are concerned, but I don't think, um, I think they were looking forward to not only that, but the joint study session because the council and the commission's getting together and, and ideas are starting to come together. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, I did come with a prepared speech as usual because that's how I feel most comfortable getting up here and I'll, I'll get to it a little bit, but I just also wanted to say at the, um, form-based codes um, seminar. I mean, it was good, but there were 60 people and there's, you know, I think 18,000 people in Arcata. So to say that everybody wants the, you know, those particular things that are in the gateway, um, I think a lot of people don't even quite realize what's still coming. So I think we need a lot more engagement, a lot more people voting, and it may never even come out of that survey that they're doing with that, but they're just, people might not be aware of it. So just that in mind when we're drawing conclusions on some of those things. Um, so with that in mind, uh, a request to the City Council to consider to establish Gateway Plan Advisory Committee, our task force. Historically, the City has, Arcata has relied on a community task force model for large-scale infrastructure projects and long-range planning accomplishments. The task force model is based upon a top-down, community-based process to ensure a final product reflective of a broad spectrum of community members. The City Council is working to finalize the Gateway Plan that best reflects community long-range vision, its priorities to the future, and its values in terms of future developments. For this reason, I request to the City Council, through a community-based and open government process, to establish the Gateway Plan Advisory Committee with the function to serve an advisory committee advisory capacity to the City Council, work collaboratively, collaboratively with the City and planning staff as directed by City Council to prepare a reflected recommendations to improve goals, policies, and implementation measures, and assist the city and staff and consultants in completing a high quality gateway plan, consisting of as little as nine, seven to nine advisory committee members and modeled after the successful Plaza Task Improvement Force. Committee members could include city council appointed residents, business owners, planning commissioners, and other diverse representative stakeholders of the community. So I would just ask you to please consider the Gateway Advisory Committee uh, Task Force, however it turns out to be, uh, proposal as you meet with the Planning Commissioners and Joint Study Session and just keep an open mind about it. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Patricia Kambianica. And um, recently someone told me I don't recognize my city anymore. And that stung. It, stu it stuck with me for a long time. So I think they're meaning the, the city, they, they don't feel like they're heard as a community more. It used to be community led. And so I think a gateway advisory um, or gateway plan advisory committee will give us the opportunity to, to not only restore the significant broken trust and bridge a divide, 
but also draw in a broader and diverse demographic of voices. It'll offer us to finally synthesize input from the past and the future engagements so that the plan wholeheartedly and clearly reflects the community's vision. It'll help to relieve um, some of the workload of staff. I'm sincerely amazed with how much staff can get accomplished, um, but we can all agree the city is understaffed, the budget is tight, and we are very behind schedule in both the gateway area plan and also the general plan. A task force can be a diverse representation of community stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, I mean stakeholders being both those who can affect this plan and those who will be affected by it a working group that can sit down together around a table to address some concerns and find solutions to ultimately create a stronger Great Way plan that people will be proud to stand behind. And just, you know, it's just how we had done it historically with the creation of our innovative wastewater treatment facility, the rock solid general plan of 2020, and you know, what we, we have done with the Plaza Improvement Task Force these are just to name a few. So it's only until there is true, honest community buy-in that we can all walk forward together in tandem. And hopefully that disillusioned person will be able to say again, this is the Arcata I know and love. Thank you. I would like to address again, you know, the basic question, is it safe to build in these areas? And this is a question I've been drilling to the planning commission and I'm doing to you too, because it, you, you have to start there. Is it a safe location to, to build? And if you can't answer that, then you shouldn't build right at this moment. And the, the people that answer that is not our staff who are very hardworking people. They're not experts in these areas. The Planning Commission, I doubt, if has experts on that too. You need at least a master's degree, a doctor's degree, and a lot of experience to be an expert. So we do not have experts that are giving you advice to say this is okay. And when pressed on the Planning Commission, we had one of the commissioners who I think is a structural engineer addressed it a little bit by the foundation and said we had have to have these massive foundations for these buildings in, in the gateway area and and they pressed again about permission to do it and he had a like wasn't sure about whether he was going to get all the okays to do that so this has not been an answered at all. And if you're gonna blow right through this and not answer that question, you're gonna get trouble down the road because we've seen that with a different issue, not mud, but with Berkeley versus Berkeley when, when the university did not at answer the questions regarding noise, pollutions, the concerns of the neighbor and the city sued them too. They lost twice in California courts. And I would also point out that in uh, Surfside, Florida, when we had a massive collapse in the last year of a high rise there and the litigation there, they're trying to settle out of court is $1 billion for one building and the city's on, on the hook and the, the people that did not maintain the building are responsible. They even went after the building that was a block away that was a brand new and said the foundation affected their, the cause of the collapse. So, I mean, they're going, and that person, the developer is settling to avoid going to court. So we're talking about litigation, a lot of money, if these questions aren't answered and done in the proper way, and that's all we, what we want. But it just seems from what I've, my limited experience of showing up to these meetings, you get your two, three minutes of fame and ask some questions and you never get your answers. And my answers, I, maybe I'm just being really difficult, but I've asked some professionals in the community and they say, you're right on that that has to be answered before they're built. It's not the other way around. I think Alex um, pointed out that, oh, they'll figure it out later. That's not the proper way to do it. You don't figure it out later. You, f you find out the answers before. And I'd also address in that meeting, they didn't come to a collusion, a straw vote. It was four stories and they said it, it was very uh, new state law that, it, that a developer could add four or five floors to that too. So it's very open-ended about that. Thanks. 
Yeah, hello, Chris Richards again. Um, I just want to verify, are we going to have a chance to do off-topic subjects again, sir? Okay. I wanted to make a statement about this recusal thing, Brian. It's, it's, it's out there, so um, I'm well prepared to talk about that. But So I'll spend this time to talk about this, uh, stay on topic with uh, Scott's proposal. And I think it's a fabulous idea. Um, as he stated, we have so many experts in this community and people, trust me, these people are ready and willing to step up to bat and really help polish this. And we're into that phase where this would be an ideal thing to get a really great working group with some, you know, work on these subtopics. I mean, you guys could run this thing and you could focus, you know, you could you could get everybody focused on the details you want. And I, I think it'd be silly to try to rush through for whatever reasons and try to use what's, what folks we have available, you know, with staff and all the committees and you guys. I mean, it's like a godsend in my, in my opinion. So um, I fully promote it and I know, you know, if it becomes something you guys think would work well, I, I know Karen would be a real valuable asset to help get it to working in, in proper order. So. Anyway, um, I'll save the rest of my time for later. I wanted to make a comment about the recusal problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Chris. Yeah, we will have um, later. Okay, later thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you. I've introduced myself earlier. Gateway. Let's 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 talk about how we plan development. Okay. The first thing is make it a proposal that's a lot more than we expect that we're going to get and then pare it down and make it look like a compromise so start by saying we're going to get a seven to eight story limit you know ridiculous but really what you want is a three or four story so you start with a proposal that's way out fetched and then you make the compromise and then you sound like you're moderate well WWBSD, what would Bernie Sanders do? Okay. Okay. First off, you know, you're paying lip service to um, uh, diverse communities. Um, right now, the development in Arcata is displacing poor people on a scale that's astronomical. Okay. The, the blunt comes to the people that have the fewest resources. It's a blunt knife. It's cutting. It's hitting hard. It's chopping left and right. People that have lived here all their lives are being forced out. I'm running into people on the streets that own businesses, okay? And they're living on the streets, okay? I was elected student body's president, and I'm living on the street. So what you have is a dysfunctional community, and you need to address the root cause of that, which is economic warfare. It's gentrification, it's class warfare, and we need to take the opportunity to blunt that knife and make it work for good. The plaza where I came for, Humboldt Plaza Development, there's a plaque honoring people, veterans of foreign wars. It was built post-war housing boom to house veterans. Now it's single women, disabled, elderly. But we need more of that. In New York City, there was a place called um, Stuyveston, and that was built post-war. And they're trying to turn it into condos because it's such a beautiful place. It's got all this open space. It's so well planned. If this is really the, peep, the, the, the crown jewel of liberal where we're going and we have the money, this is not a poor city. The economic projections are through the roof. Let's invest in making it equitable now, right now, today, starting with rent control. I don't care if they call it the People's Republic of Arcata. They did that in Santa Monica. At least some people that I grew up with still live there. Thank you very much. Yeah, start the timer. Um, so I just wanted to um, maybe do a little bit of thought experiment. I, th I think that it's more than just form-based code that, um, that a topical work group could address. I mean, we're hearing things, we're hearing a lot of different topics that keep coming up and up and over and over again. And I think we could use the, um, the wastewater treatment discussion that we had earlier. I mean, 
that it keeps coming up. Are we going to have capacity with full build out? It would be really helpful if we had like a topical work group that could spend one or two meetings, um, city staff included, and just like summarize in layman's terms. I, I would appreciate it. You would probably appreciate it too. That just summarizes the storyline and says, okay, it's going to be all right. Here's our plan. And just like try to put this to bed um, in a way that people feel comfortable with. Um, and there's a lot of those different topics and the structural issue that, that he talked about could be another one. Um, you know, the architect could address this really easily and say, okay, there's new technologies out there that can do this. You know, let's just summarize this as a white paper, educate you, educate us, educate the community and, you know, have other people help. So I, I just think that's kind of what was intended with those topic work groups. Um, so hopefully that will help you guys. <coughs> Yes, hello, thank you. Um, I've uh, known Scott since February and have been talking with him about this advisory committee for a long time. I was very skeptical for months and I had a lot of the same questions that, that you posed. Uh, does, is this just redundant? Is it gonna slow things down? Um, you've heard me speak, I think here, and, but I'm definitely at the Planning Commission, that one of my concerns, I spoke a couple months ago, one of my concerns is that we're going to go through this process in whether it takes four months or six months or eight months, we're going to get to the end and we're kind of be scratching our heads and say, how does it all fit? There's a lot of dependencies people have talked about um, that are, I feel, being overlooked. Um, we talked about uh, whether the soils in the industrial area can support tall buildings. These are questions that have to be answered so we know where to put the emphasis on housing. Uh, to the question of um, uh, are people being heard or, or you know what, what's, what's going on there, just duplicate things. Um, I know Alex uh, said that she was at the, or listened to the meeting, the Planning Commission on August 4th. Uh, Fire District Director Eric Loudensberger spoke. He said, it is incomprehensible to me that a recommendation on building height could come out of the Planning Commission or the City Council until we have a full economic analysis of what it's going to cost the city of Arcata citizens and what the, how the fire district will actually provide protection there. Um, this was responded to by saying that this will be covered in the EIR. That's too late. These things have to be decided much sooner than that. There's a, uh, a flow chart of dependencies, you might say. Uh, in terms of um, bringing people into it, um, the, you've heard people complain that in 60 seconds or 90 seconds or two minutes, you don't get a lot of time. I write articles, I make maps, I write letters to you, you receive my letters. Uh, I'm real involved in this, but the average person I think is very discouraged. Um, in terms of taking away from the planning commission, I spoke with the planning commissioner who said that uh, that commissioner's issue was that there's no actual discussion on these matters. There's people talk one at a time in a row, but there's no actual round table discussion. This could provide that. Um, the, uh, the, in terms of the form-based code, oops, I'm getting to the end. Uh, this, this, this could be one subcommittee. Um, there are form-based codes that are good. There are some that are bad. It's not a solution in itself. But mainly, I think that the advisory committee could give some oversight. I've written two articles about this on arcata1.com. Uh, I've written to you. Thank you very much. Obviously, I support it strongly, okay. <laughs> okay, here's my three minutes. I'll try to keep it lower than that. Um, the whole purpose is to provide you with information. That's the whole purpose. So if you look at it from a standpoint of it's a vehicle that allows the community to discuss these issues. We can't discuss these issues in this forum. We can't necessarily even easily discuss it, discuss them in a task force if it has to follow city guidelines. So the whole idea of a study session is that you can discuss, okay? So the idea of this committee, whatever we call it, subcommittee of the planning commission, task force, that works, working group of the Planning Commission, um, is to take an issue, investigate it, and report back. 
bring in the topical experts that know what they're doing. People will happily, I mean, we've been donating an enormous amount of time, you know. <laughs> uh, one of the members is going through all the post-its, uh, which we can now read, um, which we couldn't read until they figured out that they were too blurry uh, and couldn't be read. And that's never been synthesized. Well, one of the group here is, if RGA is going through and, and documenting them all. Freebie. You can get lots of freebies from the community if you simply ask. Define the topics, figure out the vehicles that allow them to discuss things, bring in information, do a little survey if need be. Um, however, but you need information and you need to be confident in the decisions you make. And infrastructure is just one of them. Uh, Form-based code, what the limits are, I still don't know how far form-based code extends. Does it extend to streetscapes? Does it extend to um, soils issues? I mean, you know, I don't know. But I'm simply saying that I, I think you should look at it as a resource that you can use to answer questions and help make decisions. And it could easily be assigned to the Planning Commission. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> And now, do we have anybody online? We do. Our first online comment uh, will be Anthony. Go ahead, Anthony. Hello, everybody. Um, hello, everyone. I think you can hear me now. And uh, thank you, Scott, for that presentation and everyone who commented. I feel like there's overwhelming support from the general Arcata citizenry of forming some kind of gateway area plan dedicated group because. The, um, the feeling generally now is that there's a lot of different committees and groups and planning commissioners, and they all are working on a lot of different things. But the Gateway Area Plan is probably going to have a greater impact on Arcata than any other development ever has in our lifetime. And so I think it's really important to um, listen to the community, listen to people, and then also to engage the community because a lot of us are still in shock of the gateway area plan in general. So I don't see any reason to rush through it in the planning process because like Alex said earlier, it, the building's gonna take a long time and that's why the planning process also needs to take an amount of time that's going to be appropriate to solve and consider all the issues. I think Scott mentioned that the community would be more comfortable if. Um, if the council and all of the commissioners have all of the information on hand. And I think the community would also be a lot more comfortable if we had all of the details on hand and in our awareness. And I think that, um, you know, this is a little bit more of a controversial feeling, but a real subject is that economic warfare looks like shoving grant money into population density before healing a town that just suffered the loss of cannabis and a pandemic. So we we see that happening and there I don't think there's any reason to think that no one will sue if there's a law being broken as far as conflicts of interest go because people are getting going to be upset. They already are. And so that's another reason why it's really important to get a group together to get all the facts and details straight so that we can understand what we're up against and how we could do it in a way that represents and respects what the values are here. How, why would anybody, you know, a lot of people come to Humboldt State, they hear about it from somebody who is close to them and who's, you know, quote unquote hip. And I think that that what we're facing right now is like a, a big campaign to bring people in. So we need to equally campaign to bring our values to the table. And that's what the uh, Responsible Growth Arcata is asking for with this presentation and so many other community members. Those 86 people are just the people who are in the know of what they're doing, but there are a lot more who are discouraged to get involved in that. We need to include them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. All right, our next online uh, communication is Colin. Go ahead, Colin. Oh, it's Matt. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. How'd you jump? 
Hi, uh, this is Matt Simmons. I'm a resident of Arcata and a renter. Uh, I'm also a member of the Redwood Coalition for Climate and Environmental Responsibility. Um, this this plan is urgent, and I and I don't think I'm hearing the urgency from folks in this room right now uh, that I would like to. Um, Arcata's housing element calls for this upzone to happen at the end of this month, right? And the housing element, the reason the state requires Arcata to have a housing element is so that Arcata builds enough housing to keep rents down and to keep people in Arcata. Building new housing helps prevent displacement by giving people a place to live instead of replacing people who are already here. Um, so there's an urgency to this plan and it was, it was delayed because of COVID and I, I want people to have a chance to give input and I've been going to, uh, like dozens of meetings where people have given input and have really actually impacted what I think the end result of this plan is going to be. It's not going to be what the staff draft looked like, right? There's been a lot of changes, uh, proposed already that I think are probably going to end up in this plan because you all are good at listening to folks when they give comments and write letters. And you know, it's 9.37 PM and uh, I, I, a very, as a group of very dedicated people are here giving comment right now, but I, I think it's absurd to think that it's representative of any way, in any way of the city of Arcata. And that doesn't mean I'm saying everyone agrees with me. I'm saying like, no one knows what people think. And that's a good reason to like trust you all who've been elected uh, to represent the city. I So it's about housing and then it's also about climate. And I, I think we just really have to emphasize that allowing people to live in yes, taller buildings and more densely lets more people bike and walk to work and burn fewer fossil fuels and a lot of people talk about Arcata being, you know, revolutionary. And I think that if you ask any climate scientists, that's the sort of part of a big part of the climate revolution that we're all facing is learning how to live in a city that doesn't produce as many fossil fuels. And I think that, you know, the gateway plan isn't perfect, but it's a big step in making Arcata less of a, someone's like Carcata at the beginning of this meeting. I loved it. It was like three hours ago. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, we, Whatever decision you make, it doesn't slow down this plan too much because we desperately need it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. All right, our next speaker is Sherry. Go ahead, Sherry. Hi, good evening. I guess it is getting late, isn't it? Um, yes, um, as Jane mentioned, the feedback posters from the open house back in January are being collated by tireless volunteers and the feedback dots are being counted and all the sticky notes that are visible are being documented. And so far, seven out of the 18 posters have been gone over with a fine tooth comb. So for the hottest button topic, we have building height. The opinion is overwhelming. Um, nine people said they like three stories or less. Two people said two stories or less, that seems a little unreasonable. 57 people want four stories or less. When it comes to five and six build, five and six stories, we got one person. Six stories, we got two. Seven and eight stories, zero people have said they want seven or eight story building. So we go to last night when we have a form-based code presentation and the feedback was heavily weighted towards eight story buildings. Has the community completely flipped their opinion on building height? It's doubtful. But what's in common with these two exercises is that the survey methods were informal and non-scientific. And the Gateway Advisory Committee would like to have a formal scientific survey completed. They will have the resources to reach out to the groups that have not been contacted regarding this issue as well. Um, other people have spoken to whether eight-story buildings are even physically or economically feasible so close to the bay. It would be great to have a geologist, an engineer, an architect, a contractor on the advisory committee 
so we can pin down what kind of development exactly is possible for this part of the city. And regarding the issue of delay, couldn't a developer show up tomorrow with a project and get it approved under the state density bonus law and basically build whatever they want right now? So what does it matter if the city takes the care needed to set objective development standards and get a properly detailed form-based code written in the meantime? The advisory committee will help facilitate that. Thanks for listening. Have a good evening. Right. Thank you, Sherry. All right, I'll try this again. Colin, go ahead. I think I got you over this time. Thanks. Good evening. This is Colin Fisk with CRTP, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. Um, I, uh, I sent you all written comments earlier because I didn't think I was going to be able to make this meeting, but you know, luckily it lasted three and a half hours, so here I am. Um, anyway, I'll just I'll just briefly say that um, I, I think you, you know that CRTP does doesn't support a new task force or or a new committee um, for this purpose, and really that's because it it it's uh, it's hard to see how that would add anything to the process. Um, you know, folks talk about not liking time limits for talking at meetings, and I get that, but a new task force or committee would have to have that as well, or else the meetings would go forever and they'd have to keep going and keep going and keep going. And, um, you know, I think people talk about not liking the fact that not everyone is being heard. Um, I agree with that, uh, but again, this would be, you know, a, a body that would have to abide by the Brown Act. They would have all the same limitations in terms of resources and staff time as all the other committees and commissions. Uh, it's, it's not possible for me to envision how this could, you know, add something that, that isn't already there. Um, in terms of a, a scientific survey, that would indeed be different than what's been done. A scientific survey is also very expensive uh, to do and, in my opinion, a pretty clunky tool for doing land use planning. Um, so probably, probably not what would end up being pursued. Um, I think uh, what you're hearing is that folks want more process uh, when they don't agree with the substance of what's being proposed. And I can't blame them for that, but um, I don't think that you're going to find total and complete consensus on something that's a big change like this. That doesn't mean that a big change isn't necessary. Um, and it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, pursuing uh, sort of endless meetings in search of that consensus is, is a productive uh, way to go either. So thank you. Thank you, Colin. Okay, next speaker is Greg. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, hi. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, appreciate being able to give my input. Um, you, know, you know, I live here in Arcata. I've lived here for many years, uh, off and on since 1987, um, and solid since 2014, 20, 2004, sorry. And I'm, I'm also president and executive director of Siski Land Conservancy, and we have a um, sustainable communities program. Uh, we created the Arcata. Um, the uh, Jacoby Creek School Garden, and we've worked with Sun Valley to reduce pesticides around children, and we're doing the same kind of work in Dunlark County. <clears throat> and our organization uh, supports creation of the task force. Um, and and speaking personally, um, I would appreciate having a way to provide better input. Um, you know, three minutes at a time, or written comments that might need to change. Every you know, I mean, that's onerous and. Uh, the folks who are bringing this forward to you have done so much work, and I think Sherry earlier really pointed out um, some of the benefits, and, and uh, so did the other presenters in favor of it. Um, and so, again, personally, I, I want to address uh, these uh, contentions by uh, Colin and Matt and their organizations, uh, which really uh, are really appalling. Um, you know, they're asking you to uh, not limit building heights, but to definitely limit uh, citizen input. And they want you to ignore uh, the potential um, stripping of, of the bike path at L Street 
and instead concentrated on K and 11th, and they're not mutually exclusive. So I want you to know we have several hundred supporters in Arcata, and dozens of them have contacted me very upset about these supposed green groups. Uh, and I don't want to do some competition between the groups. It's not what it is. It's, um, it's just to want to limit uh, public participation and to um, somehow say that there's such an emergency that we have to, okay, eight-story buildings is, um, you know, just beyond the pale. Um, I also want to address uh, um, Alex Stillman's uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a string of non sequiturs, but the last thing she said was, if we're going to continue being a community that people like, we're going to have to change. Well, change is here. Um, you know, I, th I think it's represented by a plan that was developed relatively in secret um, to um, stuff a quadrant of the city with absurdly tall buildings. That is a developer's dream and also obviously uh, desired by the state, which is forcing down our throats um, this expansion that they aren't allowing us to have any input on. And so I apologize for being trenchant. You know, it's not my style always. Um, but, you know, we want the task force. We want our voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. I don't have any other new public comments online. Okay. That brings us to the end of our public comment. Okay. Um, any final comments anybody wants to add here or? Anything? Yeah. Um, you know, I definitely agree, uh, you know, these three minute snippets of public comment, it's, it's not a conversation. Um, you know, I have proposed in the past that, uh, you know, we extended it to, to five minutes, um, you know, that, it, that wasn't agreed upon. Um, and I think what a lot of people forget is, um, <clears throat> I mean, if you read the Brown Act, it's really clear. You know, the business of the public is supposed to happen in the public, and it's right now in meetings like these. And we talk about, well, you can talk, you can call us, or you can email us, or we'll meet you. That's extra stuff, you know? I mean, that's it's not, um, you know, <clears throat> the, the primary way to contact us. It's during these meetings where, um, yeah, ag again, it's just restating that. The business of the public is supposed to happen in the public during these meetings. So, you know, I, I do think, um, creating a different outlet like this group where that conversation can happen um, makes a lot of sense because our current structure isn't really uh, set up for it. Um, you know, I wanted to comment on the comment that more housing uh, will bring down rents. I think that's absolutely false. I think more housing will have zero effect on rents. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that this is the largest development plan in the history of the city, right? So it's going to affect the lives of all of our 18,000 residents. Um, it, you know, it deserves a lot of careful thought. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the other comment of like, you know, we don't know how people feel. And um, I feel like I have a very strong sense of what people think because I, you know, I feel like I talk to a really di diverse group of residents every day. And, you know, to me, my feedback I'm getting, I think that the truth is the majority of our constituents are terrified that this project is gonna ruin the city that they love so much. Um, and I think this is why us maintaining the public trust by creating a group like this and recusing ourselves when we have conflicts is so important to maintain that trust. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I know personally that um, this is going to be a topic that we discuss at our study session. I know I personally have some questions for the planning commissioners um, because I know some of their questions haven't been addressed yet and they had some concerns and wanted us to do some things. So um, I know that this will be a topic of discussion at that study session. Um, and I think that at this point we have given you guys a lot of information, a lot of discussion, and I think we are going to bring our mayor back and move on to our next item. Okay. Great. Uh, oral and written communications. Oh, I'm sorry, Stacy. <laughs> it's okay. It is the time for oral and written communications. So this is the time provided for people to address the council or submit written communications on matters that are not on the agenda. 
At the conclusion of all oral and written communications, the Council may respond to statements. Any request that requires Council action will be set by the Council for a future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers addressing the Council may be limited to three minutes. Well, we are limiting it to three minutes. With um, uh, and a time limit on the overall length of oral communications may be imposed. I don't foresee that happening, so let's go ahead and get it started. Okay, thanks. Thanks, and uh, Chris Richards here again. I just wanted to make a comment on this recusal issue with the gateway conversations in the public format, and I'd like to start with a really uh, applauding Stacy way back when February, whatever it was, when she voluntarily recused herself and then wait, waited patiently for Nancy Diamond, uh, the city's attorney, to get it together to send the information to figure out does she really have to or not. And then finally, when it did come, it was a disappointment to everybody, but she really did the right thing. As a community member, I feel that that's well, more than a feeling. It's if we do this wrong and we end up with somebody filing a lawsuit because people didn't recuse themselves properly or whatever, we have to redo meetings, we have to spend much longer time, we have to get more grants, we have to go. I mean, the, the commission is pretty clear with their guidelines. And yeah, I don't know, Karen, if you guys have already sent out for Alex, Alex's information, but it would be prudent if you did so that we don't end up with this. I, personally feel she's doing the city an injustice. She should recuse herself, as Stacy did, until she knows. Otherwise, the meetings that she attends, and especially the study session, is going to be a problem meeting in the future. So my advice to Alex, and trust me, this is not a personal attack by any means, and Stacy knows this. I, I want everybody to be able to participate, but I don't want the city to have a problem down the road when we've worked so hard to get, I mean, we're not even there yet. We're a long ways away, but we definitely don't need trip hazards. So without going further into this, um, I, I will be sending more. I'll send send you another email, and I have some some other information I don't want to talk about right here in front of you know, the the chambers and everybody. But um, I really think, as a public member, I want you guys to get this right. I'm in favor of doing this well, and again, I I applaud what happened with Stacy, and I wish she could could be part of all this. But they have their reasons, and we're a small town; we got to follow it. So. Anyway, uh, thank you for my time, and uh, it was a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. It is great to hear a reference to the Carcata. Um, um, I feel that in my heart. The what's I I take this personally. I was gentrified out of a town I grew up in, Venice Beach. And I watched Google and everyone speculate and move in and take over. And what I said about Santa Monica is true. They have rent control and they have some original residents and there is some protections for the community that existed before it became, a, you know, where everybody wanted to live. Anyway. We are facing that same situation here. And I never thought it would happen so fast and so furious. But uh, what I said about the cost of services, it is passed on to the poor. It doesn't hurt a wealthy person to pay exorbitant sewer fees or exorbitant garbage fees or whatever. The person that recycles, and you, we're closing our only recycling center where you can take shit, stuff in. People have to um, pay for those that are irresponsible. And the people that are paying for it are the poor ones. I know this personally. I was meeting with the city about water. I ended up moving into a place where my friend died. And I got into the place and the landlord blames me for taking advantage of my dead friend. We both met with Karen in her office about what was happening about my gentrification while he was alive. Ruvain Moore, he was actually killed. And you can't prove it. It was by a homeless, deranged person. 
But the bottom line is, I got kicked out of there, and I told the landlord something when I was being kicked out. And I said, if you'd have spent half the money you spent in court evicting me on relocating me, we wouldn't be having this conversation. He gave away my possessions. This happened to me twice in a tiny little place, too small, unaffordable. I qualified for the grant, and I'm on the list for the grant again, and yet $950 won't get a single or a one-bedroom in Arcata right now because the prices are going up so fast, so fast, that the cost of living is way behind the reality. Arcata House can't place anybody. It's a grant-eating machine. People are getting paid to deny people services. And there are people making money off of saying, no, 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 go away. It has to stop today. I'm an example. Thank you. Come on. I'm going to bring up uh, another point that I brought up to the Planning Commission that everybody seems to like have a strong opinion of what the public is really thinking. In my opinion, we don't really know. And I pointed out to them the basic 101 fundamentals to infill projects is to send the mass mailing out to the public to find out what, what they want. And because perhaps, as I pointed out to them, I mean, look at the audience here, look at the audience at the Planning Commission. Out of 15,000 people, we're just like a handful of people that are pr pretty much almost the same people that are showing up. So obviously there's, there is a problem with the public that either they're not aware of it or they, I, they don't care or, I mean, there's something going on there. So there has to be another effort to reach out to them. And that's why I'm suggesting this mass mailing. And it's probably a good timing because you're coming down to a lot of important decisions. So this is the chance for the public to, to be aware of it and, and weigh in. Um, I'd also like to bring up your next meeting, which is a study session. Um, I don't know if very many people have thought of this, but um, you know, you're considering what, four stories, eight stories. You know, I, I don't have opinion for that for you, but I did look at the from the hill here and look down at some reference points and buildings that are four stories, and looked at the creamery with flagpole up there. I looked down in and where we're gonna have our entertainment district, there's a big tower there where the industrial buildings to get a sense of what four stories is. And I'll, I'll tell you what my opinion is, but you, perhaps somebody needs to explore this a little bit, is that anything over four stories is that you're gonna lose the view of the bay. Now, if that's important to residents, then they need to, be, they need to say that, or you need to inform them you know, for, the, for having a taller building and more housing you're going to lose your view. So that just needs to be explained. And I think uh, planning commission, whether they put a balloon on at what represents four stories, eight stories, they look at it from close up and they go up on the hill and look at it because they need to know and you need to know because you're the ones that are going to, that they're waiting for you to make a decision. They're going to give you a reference that they think maybe four stories is the right way to go. But now we got this new California loose end where a developer can basically go a lot higher than that. So it's kind of like a big mess because even if you as a group decide four stories, three stories, whatever it is, it seems like the developer is gonna have it and run to add a lot more floors to that. So I think that's something that needs to be spelled out and explained to the public too. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Joanne McGarry here. I'm gonna be really quick, but always remember um, nature bats last and all these things. But as we're talking about the same old people being here in the room and some of the same old people calling in on Zoom or on the phone, it would be really nice, um, Mayor, perhaps you can um, advise staff on this, but periodically through the meeting, it would be kind of nice to know how many people are caught, dialed in or on YouTube or whatever so that um, if they're not making public comment, at least we kind of know that there's um, some households that are actually um, tuned in. And so it'd be kind of nice to know, Karen, you know, 
how many people on YouTube, how many people on Zoom, um, so that we kind of have a sense about we're talking about important matters of the citizenry, and, and maybe not everybody's a citizen of Arcata, but um, it's, it's more people paying attention than are in this room and that are calling in. So maybe we could periodically get a number um, throughout the meeting about who's, who's watching. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good evening. I'm Fred Wise. <clears throat> when I spoke at the beginning, I may have been too subtle about the industrial area, the Barrel District. Um, I think it should have a WIAT name, and I, I hope that's understood. Uh, it is not uh, the barrel manufacturing from its earliest days, as we all know. Um, what's larger for me, I'm going to give a letter out at the end of this presentation. The situation with the letters to the Planning Commission has gotten worse. Um, it's my hope that I don't have to come here again and again to talk about this. I wrote a letter so you can read it. Um, it's not just about a lack of letters, it's lack about a lot of information. The letters, I feel, are a tip of the iceberg. The letters uh, I were, were delayed, letters from June 9th are still not in the packets. They've been one excuse after the next. The latest iteration, uh, the Community Development Director is now putting the letters online, but he's doing it in batches. The latest batch is from March 31st. My letter was June 9th. I don't take that personally. I just think it's a sham in general. Uh, as an exercise, I put all the letters on the arcada1.com website to see what the process was like. If I did it the way it is on the city website in a batch, it would have taken me 10 to 15 minutes for all the letters since December 2021. I like them individually, I think it's easier to read. It took me an hour and a half. The city council doesn't have a problem with the letters. In fact, that's why I'm giving you my letter because I know it'll be in the packet in a couple of days as an addendum. Somehow the community development department doesn't want to do that. Now you might say, what difference does it make? Well, if I read a letter about the LK Street couplet and two and a half months passes and the public is not able to read it, it makes a difference. People can't chime in. I don't meet people, you know, no one else considers it. It goes on and on. Um, I'm going to read the third sentence from the third sentence of the Brown Act, 1953, our basic law. The people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining in forms that they may retain control over the instruments they've created. I can't stress this large enough. Thank you. And I'll distribute this as a letter to all of you. Thank you. All right, we have um, online comment by Anthony. Go ahead, Anthony. Hello, everyone. Anthony here again. You know, I'm kind of grateful that uh, I ended up in my place in line because of Frank reading the Brown Act right there. I wanted to start by saying on kind of regards to the California Transportation Resources comments, um, you know, it's not that the community is seeking some kind of arbitrary consensus. We are here to provide input and improve and craft the plan in a way that suits our CADA. And that's, that's um, our right, especially as said in that plan. I, I seem to remember uh, maybe a year and a half ago, Paul or someone saying that we have some ability to resist the types of programs and things that the state pushes on us. And that was in regards to the data center then. And the reason that I, I bring that up is because if there are problems with all the questions that aren't being addressed, like the if it's even safe to build these buildings here, if there are problems, we definitely are going to suffer consequences. And the city may and the people will, but 
is the same organizations who are benefiting from the building and pushing the grants on us and insisting that we do these plans, are they gonna be the ones suing us in the end? I'm sorry, I don't know if you heard that because of my computer making a sound. Are they gonna be the ones who end up suing the city if there are problems? We really need to address these. And I think that having that um, advisory committee would be a good place to really get the conversation and into the details of it and into a place where there's a cohesion between community awareness and the decision makers decision. So that at least we know why these ideas are being pushed and we know how to push them in a way that's going to feel right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that's our only online public comment. Okay, next we have <clears throat> council and staff reports. So um, do we have any other staff updates? Uh, none tonight. Okay, and let's go ahead and go to council member updates. The iBlock party is September 5th, Monday. Yay, Yay it's back uh, on I Street in front of Los Bagels uh, from 12 to 6, and Stacy and I will be emceeing, and it's guaranteed to be a great time. Thank you. Um, so the Community Ambassador Program will begin training. It's, their hiring is at the end, and training will begin so very soon for that. And so um, the hopes is that they will be um, out uh, in the community during, um, you know, at some point starting in the month of September. That's the hopes. You know, we know how these things go, but that's what we're hoping for. Um, there are 25 people currently being served in the safe parking program, which is great. Those numbers are up. And again, still looking for um, an executive director for Arcata Main Street. And that's all I've got. Um, do you have any feedback on um, what might be going on with the, the letters taking a little while to get included? Um, I don't. I knew that we were um, going to start adding them online as a request, so I will look into that tomorrow, and I will follow up with Fred. Thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, I've been talking to um, business owners around town, and uh, they told me that you're sending out letters um, about G and H Street, and um, that they were getting. I think they said they got letters signed by you. Um, There's one in the Mad River Union. It was published in there. Okay, the cool. letter that I sent out. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to spruce up those corridors and do the flagging and stuff. So um, really appreciate you continuing that. Thank you. That's it. You're welcome. Okay, well, I will. I, I have my first HTA meeting. And just as Meredith said, um, they are doing all kinds of things in the transportation world. And they are definitely moving into uh, helping everyone through economic development, what they're wanting to do and connecting so many of the counties surrounding us together. So I think that's excellent. You know, when Joanne was mentioning um, knowing how many people are watching our meetings, et cetera, we have to remember Humboldt Access. They televise our meetings besides YouTube and um, Zoom and used to be the radio, but I don't know, maybe people can tune in that way too. Um, I, I think about, you know, property owners and, um, <clears throat> and I think about, it doesn't really matter, let's say Valley West, and there's an empty property out there right now. And maybe we, we want, how do you go on someone's property and say, we want to test your soil to see if such and such can be built there? You know, property owners have to make decisions of what they want to do, whether they want to sell, whether they want to build or not. And then they will do the process they have to do when they build. It, but a lot of the talk that we're hearing is, no, we have to know if that soil is good or not. But you aren't going to be able to do that on someone else's property and to, unless they allow you to or want you to. And then it's not appropriate for the city to do it. I just wanted to. You know, I, I hear that brought up a lot. And it's brought up a lot at the Planning Commission, too. So I don't know of anything else, but I hope to see you all in person next time and that I won't have COVID. I should be over it. I feel great. But tests aren't right yet. Well, we do wish you well soon, Council Member um, Stillman. <laughs> <laughs> it's... <laughs> 10, 10, okay. in case nobody has realized that. So, 
Um, dates of future meetings, um, just to confirm, I think it's been confirmed, but it's on the agenda, that the City Council will hold a joint study session with the Planning Commission on Tuesday, August 23rd at 6 p.m. here in the Council Chambers. Do we have consensus on that? Can't wait. We do. All right, so with that, um, we're adjourned. Thank you. Oh, a little applause. I like yeah. that.